What is happening, everyone? Welcome back to another Tour Life. We got a fun episode for you tonight. Yuli's not with us. We've got two people that you probably are very familiar with. Uh, we got Aaron Gossage, the Goose Man himself, and Ezra Aderhold coming back to the show. Boys, how we doing? Doing great. Can't complain, man. Been loving the off season, so I'm happy to ha- be on here. It looks like you're back in Colorado, right? I am. Yep. Just been. Ed- my sister's back home, so yeah, we got the whole family together. Ezra, are you in LA? <laughs> I feel like I should be, right? No, I'm in Arizona. Uh, I don't know, man. The weather here is just, it's perfect. It's like, this is the best place to be. I feel like we got big shoes to fill. I didn't know Yuli was not going to be with us. So yeah, Uh, Yuli is, uh, kind of didn't know that he had some family stuff going on. And if you know, Yuli literally him and his family have terrible internet. So he wasn't even going to attempt to try tonight because he it was it was not going to work. So you've got the three amigos tonight. Saz is behind uh, the keyboard as always. Today is Wednesday, December 27th, 2023. This is our 50th episode, boys. So you guys are actually on a big one. The big 5-0. Uh, we've got a few things to talk about. Few, uh, a little bit of news dropped. Natalie Ryan has settlement with the PDGA. We've got some Twitter hot takes from some of my followers. A little bit of player movement and maybe another rumor, another theory I have this week. Let you guys see what uh, what you think on that. We've got a, one of my favorite wild stories of the week. And then we have some listener questions as well. So let's uh, let's jump into it real quick. Natalie Ryan settlement, you guys, uh, what have you guys been doing this off season? Have you been paying that much attention to what's been going on? Not much. Gotta be honest. <laughs> I, I joke. I, I talk to my mom sometimes about disc golf stuff and she'll ask me about stuff. And I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. And the people I talk to, which is goose and Tristan also have no idea. So I, I don't know anything basically. <laughs> If you, if you want a good, like kind of recap, cause obviously on here, we, we go for a little bit longer two times grip locked that's the play you'll get all your info in like 30 minutes and uh, and have a good idea of what's going on but the big news that broke this past week was that natalie ryan uh settled with the pdga so i'm actually just going to kind of talk uh straight off of the pdga's announcement we taught we knew kind of this was going to happen a little bit we saw that uh natalie ryan had signed up for her tour card and then we also um, saw a little bit from other people as well. But what we did not see is what the PDGA had to say about it last week. And so today we have that. So this was the announcement that the PDGA made on their website. Um, the title is Modification to the PDGA Policy on Eligibility for Gender-Based Divisions for 2024 and 2025. Um, As we wrote in our announcement on December 12, 2022, regarding the PDGA policy of eligibility for gender-based divisions, we, the PDGA Global Board of Directors, value fairness and inclusion. Those values motivate our decision when formulating the policy and will continue to guide us as we evaluate and uh, update the policy as additional science and data become available. We stand by our decision to implement the policy for the 2023 season. Since that time, however, the patchwork of laws regarding transgender rights has only become more fragmented. The PDG and Disc Golf Pro Tour have been named defendants in lawsuits over the application of the policy in California and Minnesota, and judges in each state issued orders overriding the policy. It has become apparent that the law is not settled on this issue. The PDGA is not financially or logistically in a position to take the lead in multi-state litigation on this topic. For the first time in recent memory, the PDGA will end the year with a net operating loss, and it is not in the best interest of our members to continue to allocate resources to further litigation. Accordingly, and as part of a settlement ending the litigation against the PDJ and Disc Golf Pro Tour in both California and Minnesota, the Board of Directors is altering Section C of the policy by striking the following language. And so basically they're taking out players who were assigned male gender at birth are eligible to compete in the gender-based FPO division at PDJ Pro Majors only if the criteria in C3 is met. And that is transition prior to puberty. The player be, uh, began medical transition uh, during Tanner stage two or before it, it's really hard to read this because it's actually striked out, but or before age 12, whichever is later, 
Uh, the player continuously maintains uh, testosterone level and serum below 2.0. Um, so basically, this update goes into effect January 1st, 2024. It will remain in, defe- in effect through 2024 and 2025. During that time, we will continue to evaluate the policy and what fu- future changes, if any, may be necessary to promote fairness and inclusion. Um, we understand that our members have diverse thoughts, feelings, and opinions on this topic. The primary responsibility of the PDJ Global Board of Directors is to be good uh, stewards of disc golf worldwide. Uh, and then kind of continue a little bit. So basically what that means, Natalie Ryan will be able to compete at all elite series events next year. We'll be able to compete at all majors next year. Um, the decision. So this decision was basically also uh, part of the decision was also that Natalie would agree to drop all pending lawsuits in California and Minnesota. So they can came to agreement on that. Now there was a time last year, if you guys remember around preserve the disc golf pro tour, were just going to straight up cancel the FPO. They, there was some rumors kind of floating around that this was like a financial concern keeping FPO going. And so they were just going to cancel it all. And they ended up coming back and creating a new series called the United series. Um, My big issue with this is their statement that they made where they basically stated that they are, they cannot financially or logistically continue with litigation. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Is that like a big concern for us that the, the organization that's basically governing disc golf is, is not saying, Hey, we actually changed our mind on this issue. They're actually saying like, we can no longer fight this issue. Yeah. It sounds like they have their hands tied a little bit. They don't really kind of sounds like they don't, they don't really have a choice. It's like they either have to, yeah, either either just let let it let it happen, let let you know people like this play, or I guess the the alternative would maybe just be to cut the FPL like we, like we talked about, um, almost happened in the past, and that's that's sketchy too because then you don't know how it's going to affect even MPO or just the whole disc golf pro tour in general. <clears throat> yeah, I would say that uh, one of the things is that they like settled their whole uh, thing, and I, I kind of like trust in the decisions that they're making at this point as being in the best interest for everyone. So um, I don't know. One of the big things I want to say is just like, there's so many people out there that are like, Oh, the PDJ is horrible. The PDJ is awful because of this or that. And I think that they are just trying their best to um, do what is in the best interest for, you know, disc golf in general moving forward. And if this is what they decide, then I, I'm kind of, I'm sticking with it. I, I think that they have more facts than I do. The the interesting thing here is like, what if, you know, they, I, I believe they did do a survey about to, and again, these surveys, it's like very few people actually ever do these surveys, but because this is like a member based organization, what if the majority of the members are like, no, we want this to be fought. And, and then in that regard, they're actually not doing what's best for the members, right? No, that's an interesting thing to say for sure. Um, and you've got a great point. I think that um, it is in the best case of those those members. So you, you do have to appease those people. One of the things I would say is that this is mainly on the Pro Tour level. So um, I would also say that Disc Golf Pro Tour has a big say in what's going on here as well. And I do think that all the every member of the PDGA has a say in this, but uh, I think there are different levels to it. And I think that in order to like keep the Pro Tour going on, which is where this um, this big issue is, I don't know, being the you know the for- forefront of this big issue, that that's kind of where you need to appease you know both sides. Yeah, the Disc Golf Pro Tour actually. They made a statement as well. They said, while the Disc Golf Pro Tour did not wish to see adjustments to the policy at this time, the tour recognizes the PDGA as the regulatory authority and governing body of the sport and power to set these policies. It's become clear that the sport of disc golf cannot bear the weight of edu- educating this issue on adjudicating this issue on a national or international level at this time. Further development on this policy will likely be derived from changes to IOC policy, state and federal law. So it seemed like the Disc Golf Pro Tour and the PDGA thought, hey, we're going to stick our necks out a little bit on this policy and we're going to go away from because initially when they um, 
initially when they set the policy, they were just like, we're just doing what the IOC does, right? We're just doing what the Olympic committee does. And they were just following suit. And when they separated themselves from that, they were now the ones that were taking all the, you know, the blunt force, I guess you can say with the litigation, the money, the resources, all that on doing this. And so what it looks like is they're kind of saying like, disc golf is not in a position right now to where they can be trying to set precedent on, you know, transgender uh, divisional play in sports. So it looks like what I guess the disc golf pro tour and the PDJ are doing is they're sitting back and they're waiting for maybe another sport, another organization to step forward and take that, that brunt of the, of, of the, of the force and set something in precedent to then they can say, Hey, we're going to fall suit with what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. I, um, they, it's, it's growing sport, you know, it's disc golf, you know, there's not, I, I guess I don't know how much money there is in it, but it, it is one of those situations where it's, it's hard to be that like first person to, um, go one way or the other on the issue. So, um, it's a rough spot to be in for sure. Um, then the other thing I'd like to say, this is just kind of my opinion personally on this whole issue that I'd like you know everyone to hear. There are two different arguments going on, and the first one is, is a uh, trans woman um, a woman, and does she deserve the rights of every woman, you know, all the rights that a woman has? That's one issue. And then there's another issue, which is competitive fairness in sports. Does a trans uh, person get an advantage in sports and therefore give them a competitive edge over the competition? And when people are talking about this issue, so many times those two issues get joined into the same argument. So then it's no longer, you know, one thing or the other thing. It's the whole thing joined and it becomes a lot more, um, I don't know, hateful, a lot more. It, there, there's so many more things going on in that situation that I think it's really important to keep those two issues separate and really just try to fight for the one specific part of that that you are after. And it might be both. It might be, you know, neither. So like, I don't know. Th that's just my thought on the, the whole argument in general. Yeah. Natalie even made a post where, you know, basically saying that she felt like um, she was being targeted and felt like this was like an attack on her. And the thing where I, I kind of step aside from that is Natalie could always play professional disc golf. The MPO is open. Everyone can play an MPO. So the idea of the disc golf pro tour saying, Natalie, you're not allowed to play in the FPO was not saying, Natalie, you can't play professional disc golf. You could still play professional disc golf in MPO. So that's where I, that's the one thing I kind of always disagree with is I never feel like this is an attack saying, oh, they're taking my right away from being able to play professional disc golf. No, anyone can play professional disc golf. What they're doing, and this has always been my stance, is if we're going to have divisions, right? If we're going to say that if you're 50 years old and above, you can play in this division. And if you're 50 years old and below, you can play in this division. There's a reason why we're setting these divisions. And so if we're going to have an, an MPO where it's open for everyone, and then we're going to create a division specifically for female players, women players, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is we're trying to give them a platform because if there was just an open, if only disc golf was MPO, and again, I would love to hear the comments come after me on this, there would be no FPO players on tour. Now, granted, maybe a Kristen Tatar could be sponsored in being out there, but at a very few events would Kristen Tatar be able to cash. So she would only be on tour spe uh, specifically for like the sponsors, right? And so you have to create a vision for them to basically play. That's my big thing on it, is if we're doing it in the first place, there obviously is a reason for doing it. Yeah, I agree. I, I want to touch back on what Elon said about having the two issues separate. Uh, I don't think you can have the two issues separate. And I don't think it has to be, I don't think it has to be hateful. I think, you know, we want to obviously take into account everybody's, you know, um, everybody's opinions or everybody's wants, but I don't think they can be separate issues since if, if I guess trans women, all women, um, if trans women are women, then there should not be any genetic advantage. So if, if you, if the answer for that question is that they are not the same, 
then that's where having them in the FPL was maybe not as fair. You know, and I don't think it needs to be hateful because I think, like Brody just said, um, the, the the MPO division is for mixed mixed pro division, so anybody can play in that division. Um, but I I think trying to separate those two um, points of contention is maybe difficult. It is very difficult. And um, what, the thing, I guess what I'm getting at here is that um, if you're born a biological woman, um, mm. you know, Kristen Tatar, for example, um, you have this, you know, right to play FPO, right? You, you're, you're allowed to play FPO because you're a biological woman and that is your right. So then mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is that it, it, a little bit is saying that you don't view Natalie Ryan as a woman, if you don't let her play MPO or FPO. Oh, and uh, yeah. you, you see what I'm saying there, where there's kind of a I little see. bit of, of mix. You're basically trying to separate two. like a personal, like more of the personal side versus like the professional side is like, yeah, you're yeah. just trying. Yeah. I, it, and, 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 but I see Ezra's point too, of where it's like, man, there's a lot of gray, there's up. a lot of gray area there too, going back right. and forth. And, um, and because of that, it makes it sketchy. But I think that there are ways of wording things, especially in the competitive fairness aspect of the sport that can be a mm -hmm. lot less offensive and um, really help the situation move forward in a progressive way rather than being so kind of um, one side or the other. So uh, extremists, you know, that kind of thing where it, it does really um, – create this like dynamic where there's there's lots of adversity where you get you know natalie ryan saying hey i'm gonna you know burn down the pdj or whatever you know you get this very like crossover like it, it, it's just a battle against each other and I, I think that there's kind of a middle ground in there where you can talk about things from an objective perspective which is hey i don't think this is necessarily fair because um you just have an advantage and that's why we have the, the divisions and things like that um, but i'm not taking away from the aspect of you know what you know being a trans woman uh, is so i don't know it's a, it's a touchy issue but um, that's just like where i would like to see people uh, move a little bit more towards and i think that it'll be more productive in the end yeah i think too like a lot of people think we have you know the world or the society has gone in a direction that is like more hostile, more hateful. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I think it's just easier to be uh, vocal and, and, and spread your hate than it used to be. Because if you go back to some, you know, Thanksgivings or Christmases and you've got, you know, a, a sister's boyfriend coming in or the uncle or someone and they have like a different political belief or religious belief, there was always some like contentious arguments or discussions had right that's i feel like that's always been around but now because of social media it's so easy for someone to go on their phone and quickly in a tweet or something respond to someone or name call or whatever it may be and back back then it was very hard you kind of had to do it to people's faces and let's be real most people are very um not what's the word not awkward but um they're, they're not, they're not uh, bold enough to kind of come out and like, Hey, I, I know you don't believe in this and I do, I'm going to talk to you about it in your face. Right. People are more right. just like, I'm just going to go on but on social media. People are just willing to fire whatever behind their, you know, Twitter account. People are probably less bold now too, because they can use the outlet of social media as well. So it's probably made people less bold. I think too, it's also easy to confuse. Oh yeah. It's, it's easy to confuse like a difference in beliefs or a difference of opinion with hate too. I don't, you know, I think a lot of people think, oh, they don't, agree, they don't agree with me, so then they hate me. And it's like, I don't think that's necessarily the case uh, either. Very true. Um, even to touch on that same thing, I think that it's so much easier to hear the extremes too. If you've got one person that says, hey, I hate you, and then you have, you know, 99 yes. people in the middle that are like, hey, this is, you know, yada, 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 being much more respectful. The only thing you're going to focus on is that extremist, like, and all right. it takes is, you know, a couple of those people saying that to, to really fuel that drive, yeah, to... Yeah, and then it's easy to lump in a bunch of those people in the same like extreme kind of group too. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. You're you're not you're not going to yelp to be like, yeah, my meal today was pretty good. You know, you're going to yelp to <laughs> right. be like, I had a hair. My my waitress was sassy. Uh, it was over. You know, that's <laughs> great point. That's kind of that's kind of that's kinda the uh, same situation. Not to say that's happened to me. Uh, <laughs> To finish this off, both the PDJ and the Disc Golf Pro Tour said that they were, will continue to evaluate local, state, and federal laws, as well as the International Olympic Committee guidance on the issue as they plan for comp competition rules in 2026 and beyond. 
So it seems like these are the rules for next year in 2025. And then after that, uh, we'll kind of get back into it. I'm sure, I'm sure leading into the 2026 season, this will kind of be brought back up and uh, we'll kind of see where we go there. All right, let's talk about finally, this is something that we've guys discussed. And for those that are listening, me, Aaron and Ezra basically roomed at what? 90%. We, we had like Airbnbs together about 90% of the tournaments last year. Yep. Yeah. And if you're talking about like, um, uh, contentious is contentious the right word? Contentious? Don't know. Like, what, are you, what are you trying like, to use it for? Ar- like argumentative? Oh. Is that contentious? I think it's contentious. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think you're right there. We we've yeah. had we've we've had our fair share of our uh, of That's arguments. That's what we all agree on, actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> throughout, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, that, we've, we've had our fair share of arguments throughout the year, um, but we used to always love to just talk about everything and anything. Um, it was probably me bringing up mostly the, 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 disc golf, the disc golf conversations, but we got into it. And one of the ones that I brought up a couple times was the fact that the PDGA doesn't have like a good statistics that they own. They're, they're always using someone else's stats and it was, it always just seemed like not Bush league, but like, it didn't seem very professional that that wasn't coming from them. Uh, I know the disc golf pro tour has kind of worked with you disc a little bit at, at trying to get better stats as well, but someone that has been doing a really great job in the stat world is stat Mando. And so the PDJ has now acquired stat Mando. I don't know for how much, I don't know if this is why the, the PDJs were, um, uh, uh, reporting a loss for the first time because 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 we know the one thing we know about the PDJ is when they pay for certain things they do it really poorly and I don't get me started with how much they paid for the ratings but um, this is something the the acquiring Stat Mando this is something I think is really really good for the PDJ for disc golf um, the article that they kind of came out with nothing really was said about what we can expect, what we can look forward to. It was all kind of just fluff of like, this is going to be great and we're going to work together on projects. And so there's not really anything concrete to be like, Hey, you can expect to see every single person's distance recorded and this new stat and none of that. But what are your guys' thoughts on this? So I got to be honest with you. You got to go. No, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll go first. I don't know much about Stat Mando. They uh, will post stats about this and that, and I'll be like, "Wow, that's a really cool stat to have." But like, I've gone to their website, and maybe it's just because I don't ever use it. But I don't, I don't know almost anything about it, so I'm, I'm not the best person to ask about this whole situation. But um, they have posted several times, you know, um, Instagram things like that, tagged me in things. There, I'm like, "Oh, that's a really cool stat, actually." I'm glad that you know you shared that. So um, I do agree that the PDJ does need to get more statistics like that going, but I honestly don't know too much about Stan Mando myself. Sure. Yeah. Hope, hopefully the, hopefully bringing on the PDJ, or I guess bringing on Stan Mando to the PDJ uh, can kind of benefit Stan Mando with some of those resources to get some more stats. Uh, my question is, do you know, does, does Stat Mando just get those stats from UDISC? No, oh, so- I mean, they, so oh. they 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 they've worked with the PDGA before. Um, we okay. actually have we have actually have a guy too that is trying to pull uh, a bunch of the statistics and or you know records and whatnot. Um, so from the article, it sounded like they had already had some sort of relationship to where they could actually pull all that information okay. from. So I don't know if they're really necessarily going to be getting any like new information that they didn't already have access to, um, but. Just to kind of answer your question of like, you know, Aaron, you're like, I'm not really sure what Stat Mando does or whatnot. Like one thing that is really lacking in disc golf is just stuff to talk about sometimes. And that's even on the live commentary. So, you know, if you're just like, oh yeah, this person's birdied two holes in a row. If you can like fill that in with like, this person has birdied three holes in a row this many times already this season or whatever, just throwing statistics to have something to talk about is always way better. And, you know, if you watch any commentary of any other sport, they're just constantly being fed. I don't know if you guys, I just went to a basketball game not too long ago and we were sitting actually kind of pretty close to Reggie Miller. Um, I think the, the other person was Doris and 
they had like four or five people that were just like passing them notes and stuff. And they would, you know, they would just open these notes and they would have like a stat or they would have some sort of information of like, this guy went to this high school and they'd have stuff to talk about. And so hopefully that is something that kind of stat Mando will add to the PDJ majors and also the disc golf pro tour. Just give us something to talk about. Right. I, I totally agree with that. I think we are lacking a little bit on that front. Uh, like you said, in all these other sports, they'll throw all kinds of stats up there. Yeah. Um, football games, they'll do this new thing where they'll gray out one team and then they'll just have the other team and then t- you know give that one stat about that team. That's something I've noticed. But um, one of the things I have noticed about Statmando is most of their stuff is just like could be pulled from a database. So, yes. for instance, one of the things that happened was they put out, uh, this was last year, number of holes played in a row without a bogey and it was kind of a cool stat i was on that list and it was one of those where i was like oh i had no idea you know and i had no idea where everybody else was on this front i knew i had a long stretch there of not bogeying but it was like um that's something that you could pull up if you just had the stats of how the tournaments went and i guess it's really nice that they're now with the pdga and they can have all of these databases filled with all of these numbers that you know when they're looking for this it should be a lot easier for them to just pull up those exact stats and then they could throw it right out to the announcer and they could be like oh you know i had this putt where you know i hit first available got up to maybe 70 feet and the announcer could be like, Hey, Aaron's got this putt to go 99 straight holes without a bogey bogey. You know, can he keep the streak going? So, you know, adding that stuff into it is definitely um, important and it keeps the fans engaged. Yeah, Ezra, I think you were on like a circle one thing where you, yeah, hey, you had, like, I was going to be, yeah, there was, it was, it was most sulk one putts made in a row. I think, I think yeah. you really got me, but I, See now, th- this is where it's like I'm wondering where they get the stats. Cause, like, I'd assume it is from UDisc because I don't. I've never seen like a stat Mando guy taking stats. No. And then, unfortunately, with, with UDisc, obviously, some of the times the UDisc hosts don't necessarily get everything right. So I don't even know if that stat for me is exactly correct. Because sometimes, you know, you're maybe just outside of circle one, you miss, or you're just inside of circle one, you miss. They count as circle two, whatever it is. So I'm not sure if it, if it is a legit second place. But um, yeah, I mean, we will we'll see. I guess if. Uh, they can have some you remember that one tournament I went like a hundred percent circle two and I made, I was like 12 of 12 or 14 of 14. Now I, I was like, I think I only made like four circle two putts that I, I can remember. But yeah. I think my U disc or one day was just like circle two, bang, circle yeah. two. Bang. Four, right? <laughs> the thing is though, is like, for, like when I play, like I don't, I don't really care too much if the stats are wrong no. as long as the score is right. So it's like, I'd much rather have them get all the stats incorrect, the score, right. And not like have to say anything to any of us. Then, like, try to ask us to go back and play the holes, you know, through in our head to, to get the stats right. It's, I don't yeah. Know. That, There's some, there, there are some players that are like super stat, like, they want it right. So they will, yep. after the round, like, email someone to be like, hey, they had me as a circle one make and it was actually a circle two. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not that way. Right. Um, I think that the stats are getting more and more important. And uh, this was two years ago, but UDISC actually emailed me and said, hey, we've had so many complaints about the stats that were recorded for your round. Could you just fill out a whole round for us and submit it to us? And I did. And it was vastly different than, you know, what was scored on UDISC. But um, they were like, yours is just such a so many people were asking questions about it because I had zero percent circle one makes. I had, um, you know, it's like three for three from circle two and had six throw ins. <laughs> as well as my stats recorded and i was like I, I think i only made like two circle two putts and then just everything in the circle so you I know was, you know it help uh, two things that would help statistics you would have would be one would be like better defined circle one circle two better defined fairways and not on fairways but cool. also if you had someone not have to do four people yeah threesomes baby yeah. threesomes yeah. four is so many people like if you're brand new at it too like, oh my gosh. Like I'm I'm with you, Ezra. Like if they just get the score right, I'm fine. Four people is an absolute nightmare to try to Well, I have to pay if the pace of play is good, do all people are throwing and then somebody else is already ready to throw, it's just going fast. It's like, yeah, I, I can understand why the people people mess up. Yeah. You you get yeah. some of these people these vo- these volunteers too, they get so frazzled. I feel so bad for them because I'm sure they've yeah. had players like yell at them and stuff, getting upset that their stats and stuff aren't right. And they're just volunteers. I'd love to see like Bushnell sponsor it one year and just give every volunteer a Bushnell and then, you know, just be like, Hey, just hustle up there, you know, 
measure every single throw and you will have, you know, then you could actually add in some of these stats where, you know, instead of circle one misses and makes, you know, Ezra's going to love that 29 feet. He's gonna he's gonna have he's gonna have a volunteer right in front of his disc and he's gonna be standing there like um and like, hold on a second, I, I got I gotta get the right. distance. <laughs> I was having flashbacks to the fourth event of the season last year while Anthony literally hit somebody that was doing that, which you know maybe we don't need to bring up sore memories here, but it can, <laughs> get, it can get dicey. Um, I think that it does work really well though on the lead cards. They do have yes. two U discers and it makes it so much easier. And I, I never have noticed them. They, they stay so far out of the way and get everything done without me noticing it so much better. Cause there are two of them. And I think mm-hmm. that that's a big, a big benefit. And again, it's just more, you know, time and resources. When do you right. guys think like the disc golf pro tour will have their own like score online scoring? Cause like right now, like if you want, mm-hmm. if, if you're on the course watching it, and you're like, hey, I want to see kind of what this person's doing right now. You're not going to the Disc Golf Pro Tour app to see the scores, right. to see the updates. You're going to another app. What are your guys' thoughts on that? I think that the most likely thing is that Disc Golf Pro Tour will buy UDisc. I think or have UDisc some sort of partnership with them. Partnership with them. I think that uh, there's UDisc is so big right now. It does everything so well that there's not really any reason to start from scratch. I think that it's going to be a partnership kind of thing, and then we're going to get that. And then boom, they're just going to put you know like on P- on Disc Golf Pro Tour's website. They'll be like, here's the UDisc of it. So then it can actually promote UDisc as well as the Disc Golf Pro Tour having the scores on their website ready to go. That makes sense. I feel like in order for that to happen, though, I feel like the Disc Golf Pro Tour would have to separate from the PDGA, which I don't really see happening for a while. Hmm. Right? Because I don't, I don't think the PDGA would be okay with the Pro Tour using UDisc's scoring system when the PDGA has put a lot of effort into their own scoring system. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It is something that is very unique to Disc Golf. Uh, golf, they have, there's so many different apps and stuff that you can do, like, go on and put scoring and all that stuff. But the majority of people are just like doing paper cards. And, right. and it seems like you I agree with you goose. Like you is like one of the bigger, if not biggest potential companies in disc golf. Like yeah. they, they're kind of shaping the sport a little bit with, with what all the stuff that they're doing. Yeah. I, I don't even know if they can buy them out. Like if I'm you disc, right. I'm not, I'm That's not, sell, I'm not selling. I think a partnership, like you're saying, is, is yeah. very likely, though. I think that they, they both do their jobs really well, and they'll be like, hey, we can make a better you know, product as a whole if we just combine some, some stuff here. Um, on top of that, I think UDisc really needs to start expanding, too. I think they need to try to um, add in some different stats. I think a couple of the stats are not that, I don't know, uh, they, they don't make much sense. They don't, uh, they're not super relevant versus there's some other stats that would be um, – a little bit more i don't know so like i I guess here's one of them for you um you've got like an on fairway off fairway um i feel like you could also add like an obstructed or unobstructed to like your circle one circle two kind of putts and just Mm -hmm. add in a little bit of this like oh you know there's there's something going on here and you, you could do some different similar things like that that would just give fans a little bit more information yeah no i I, I like that it is so tough with disc golf because a lot of the times you could be in the middle of the fairway and have a tree in your way, or you could be in the rough and have a gap or not have a gap or, you know, like, like you just said with the putting too. It's a, it's a tricky one without, without being able to, they almost need to have like a picture of the, of each hole. And then like, you know, show where the disc is and say, Oh, those little right. tree right So uh, it, there's just so much going on to make it, to make it difficult. Yeah. yeah don't, it, all these things we're talking about makes better content, but it's just more time and resources to make it happen though, too. Um, I think that the, having that diagram of where everyone is on the fairway would be super nice to have for all the commentators just to be like, Hey, this is where this person is. I know that it was kind of hard to see from the camera footage, but this is where this shot went to and what they have from there. That's crazy too. Like the, the scramble one is the one that I think is like the worst stack in the world because if you throw your disc off the fairway and then you're able to um, still manage to get a par, that counts as a scramble. But if you throw an right. OB shot off the fairway and you can't get up and down to save your par, now that also counts against you. It's like one half. Uh, uh, there, there are some. Uh, there's some in there too where it's like we we already talked about like circle two. I would love to see a 33 feet to like 40 feet, a 40 to 50. Uh, you know, more, right. more breakdown. But again, that goes back to like, we're having volunteers now have to 
see even more. We're, we're just not there yet. So, all right, another, let's talk. Oh, go ahead. Go here's ahead. another quick one for you. The throw-in stat, I think it's just all over the place. Um, so many people think of, you know, your best throw-in players like Bradley Williams, Greg Barsby, you know, they, they have great throw-ins, but, you know, the people leading the stat are Gannon Burr, Ricky Wysocki, Isaac Robinson, because they're putting from that far. And I think that there needs to be some sort of differentiation between a putt and a throw, too, mm. because they're, they're, they're two different things. And the only thing that we have separating right now is the distance. Interesting. Yeah, so technically you could have, you could have someone throw it from 70 feet and someone putt it from 70 feet, and you're all saying they should almost count as two different stats. That's what I would say. Um, it is and, a different then, degree, yeah. and then you could have the it's stat of feet uh, you know, made of putting. And then if someone makes a 200 foot putt, you just throw that on there versus if someone throws in, you know, or aces or something like that, that doesn't go on your putting stat, but having that, like, you know, that's a, I think that's a golf stat. I don't watch enough golf, but they have that like feet, feet made of, yeah, of it's one, it's one of the best stats, something that disc golf definitely yeah. would love. I would love to have for disc golf. If, but it's not really possible right now. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. All right. Let's talk some player movement. Let's talk some rumors. Neither one of you have anything interesting to tell the podcast, right? Nope. Yeah. Same Not old. Yeah. Same old, same old. Um, <laughs> but we might have someone joining Ezra here in a little bit that might have something interesting to tell us. So I'm very curious to see if he will uh, spill the beans, if you will. Uh, hey, that's, tr that, that's, Tristan <laughs> that's, that's, that's Tristan Tanner. Tristan Tanner is uh, leaving Latitude 64. <laughs> He made a post on Instagram about it. Again, kind of, kind of Chandler Kramer esque. He he did not ask his followers where he should go. That would that would be the big difference. But there wasn't a hey, I'm leaving Latitude. I'm going with this person, and that is kind of a theme that we are seeing this off season. It seems like there are more people that can't get the numbers right, or something happens to where maybe. Um, the manufacturer is like, hey, we, we can't do the same thing as we did last year. And so people are leaving and trying to find something else. We've seen a lot of people announce that they're leaving. We have not seen a lot of people announce where they're going. So one that we did see, though, Jakob. Jakob Simrod did resign with Latitude 64. Uh, we had Ben Calloway resign with Latitude. Uh, with No, excuse me. Oh. With, Dis with Discraft. Resigned with Discraft. Uh, we have Chandler Fry, who this was a kind of a crazy one when I saw this because Chandler Fry, I really think of Discraft when I think of Chandler. So him leaving Discraft is is a crazy thing. I don't know uh -huh. where he'll I don't know where he'll end up, but he announces that he is leaving Discraft. We have Paige, Paige Shu resigning with Discraft. We have we we called this a while ago. Again, I'll say this to um, anyone that uh missed last podcast ricky came out and was talking about how hey we shouldn't leak what people are saying and whatnot emerson keith was like telling people that he was leaving lone star and then those people started telling other people and the word got around so we kind of knew this was happening but emerson keith did announce officially on his instagram that he is leaving lone star uh, i think i think i think that was this oh, yes, week right. I think that was okay, this yeah. week. I don't. I don't know exactly if it was today or not. Um, then you have Hannah. I always mispronounce her last name. Do you guys know how to pronounce Hoon? Hun. Hun? That's what Hun? I've always heard. Yeah. It's great to me. I need to attempt it. Okay. <laughs> Hannah Hun is leaving West Side. So, all those announcements, we either had people leaving or we had people resigning. We never got anyone going somewhere else yet. And the big one that we're all waiting for is Eagle McMahon. And if you guys didn't have your 10, uh, 10 cap on last week for my conspiracy theory on Eagle, <laughs> where I basically said he's retiring from disc golf and is going to try to be a professional, uh, Kendama, Kendama player. Yeah. Um, I've got a new thought this week. I have a new thought. And this was, this was like a meme I saw posted somewhere. So that kind of got my head spinning and I was like, this actually makes a lot of sense. So you have MVP poster boy, a uh, po poster boy, James Conrad. Okay. Those are the discs that have the black rims. You have axiom poster boy, Simon Lazat. 
Those are the discs that have colored rims. Streamline, not an overmold, also owned by MVP. This is all three of these different companies are all or you know are all under the same umbrella. There's no one for Streamline. Mm. Could we see Eagle fitting into string, Streamline? And now you've got the three-headed dragon, James Conrad, Simon Lazat, Eagle McMahon, all promoting different lines of MVP discs. Thoughts, boys? It's a good take. I feel like, it's, I feel like that's more likely than him being a Kendama playoff. But <laughs> what do I know? Well, this uh, is not a conspiracy theory. The last one was a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Hey, just because it's conspiracy theory does not mean that it's not true. <laughs> that is true. Right? Just, just saying. One thing I'll say, I think this is kind of funny. If that does end up happening, I think it'll be kind of a funny situation for Simon because, uh, you know, his whole big thing was, hey, I want a fresh start. I want something new. I want all these things going on. And he's gotten all that stuff. And it may be other than this, but like one of those things I think is like, it's been the crush boys for so long, you know, him and Eagle, you know, playing together. And maybe his whole point was like, hey, I want, I want a fresh start and like, you know, something different than that. And then MVP signs him on, and then boom, Simon's like, come on, guys. Like, you're just going to do me like that right back to the same thing? Well, I, I think, I mean, I think with how much money MVP <laughs> is paying Simon and how much money Simon is making MVP, I, I, I think he probably would have some sort of relationship with them on, like, hey, at, at the end of the day, MVP is going to do what MVP is, is best suited for them. But I don't think they would probably bring someone on that he was like super anti having. But where I'll disagree with you there is because I think if Simon can be the Axiom guy, that is a little bit of a separation where Dismania, everything was Dismania. Good and this to, this to me feels almost kind of like Toyota and Lexus, right? Two people, okay, right. w- one guy sponsored by Toyota, one guy sponsored by Lexus. The same person is writing the checks for both, but to the outside world, the perspective, it looks different. And I'm wondering, do you guys see other manufacturers maybe going this route of like having mm-hmm. different people for different lines? Well, we've also seen the similar thing with um, Trilogy. Um, yes, it's it's hard to like discount that they've had the, that same thing going for a long time, and it's not quite at the extent that you're talking about because all three you know companies are defined and have multiple star players rather than just that one guy that's the face of it. But you know I could see it going that way if you had like you know Matteo Westside you know Ricky on what's he on DD Dyna- right now dynamic yeah you know I I could see him doing that kind of thing where they get another guy to be their number one you know latitude. You know, whoever it is, I I don't know I think, anything. I so. think Latitude has well, a lot of the European players, right? Well, now that's all House of Disc, anyway, right? So isn't right. all those two companies this like kind of intertwined with Disc Mania and maybe like Castaplast and a few other ones as well? Yeah, I think. So I, think, I, I don't know if that changes things. Well, I think prior the the trilogy was kind of intertwined because like some were making discs for one another, but they yeah. were they were separate. You right? Um, I I believe. If you guys are familiar with Hooligan Disc, they announced that they aren't going to have Lone Star make their disc anymore, right? So mm-hmm. in that situation, like Axiom can't just be like, I we don't want MVP making our disc anymore. Like MVP created Axiom, MVP created Streamline, where oh, yeah. these three were kind of separate, but then someone bought them out. So now they're kind of back mm-hmm. in this the same world. So right. I I'm just wondering for like the, the big question here is more for like Innova and Discraft, right. right? These are like so the talking. two the two big dogs, and there's the balloons. Um, those are the two big <laughs> dogs. Uh, do we see something? <laughs> wait, wait! I'll give you this one. Let me give you this one. This is my favorite. Cool. This is oh. this is the fireworks. Can we do that too? So what you're saying is no, like, like you're on Innova Android. comes out with uh, another company that's like Halo. So like all their Halo plastic becomes, you know, one company. And then they've also got Innova on another company. And they've created two like separate entities where they could have a a person at the top of one and the other. Yeah. Like what if Discraft was just like, hey, Discraft is going to be ESP and Z. Like that is Discraft. And then Mm. they they create a new line. And this new line is this plastic. And they maybe change the molds a little bit. Like I... I, uh, or they I'm go, gonna, 
I'm just we've wondering. We've got Nick Beast, and we've got Dark Horse Classic. Oh, yeah, no. I'm just wondering if that if that maybe is a play because we've all we've always talked about that if like there is this kind of cannibalize cannibal that's such a hard freaking word for me to say <laughs> cannibalize cannibalization. Yeah, I think <laughs> I'm adding. Go. You got I it. I think I add a syllable, but there is some of that at a certain point uh, where you 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 have a team so much of where hey buy my disc buy my disc buy my disc buy my disc buy my disc, and that one person can only buy so much. It's like, well, what if you were able to separate that to where now these guys are kind of separated a little bit. These guys are separated a little bit. Now you can kind of be like, oh, well, like I, I got to get this from over here, but then I also got to get this from over here. It's a little bit easier, I think. But I mean, I yeah. think Discraft and Eva are still the big boys. So I, I think they the way they're going is probably the way that the others will probably follow or maybe not. At one point, Blockbuster was the big boy. Let's not forget. I think there is always going to be that that competition, though. Even if you do separate stuff out, like I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, th I think I think there's always going to be that. So even if you're on the same team as somebody, there's going to be some cannibalization. And if you're on a different team, like they'll they'll still it's still like a fan base and a fan base, and still trying to kind of I guess compete for dollars as bad as that sound, but sounds. But um, I think it's also interesting. Discraft kind of has DGA. DGA under its wing, not quite the same thing as having like a different type of disc because it's it's all you know ESP or Z or whatever it is. But Innova kind of got away from that since they used to have Disc Mania, I believe. And now does does Innova even have? I guess does Innova make they just what, have Infinite's um, disc or? Millennium, Millennium, Millennium. Yeah. and yes. I think they do make okay. Infinite's disc as well. I do think so. Yes. Okay. So that yeah. that that's the same relationship as like. Discraft with DGA or Lone Star with Hooligan last year of where at one point, you know, DGA can just say we're done and we we're going to make our discs ourselves or um, now granted, I don't know who would own the molds and all that. That's a, that's a completely different, you know, out of my realm, but yeah. I, I thought this would be kind of the first time we saw this where someone strategically, you know, they brought James Conrad, then they brought Simon Lazat. And then they bring Eagle, like they strategically, it almost kind of like they plan this out of th this is how we're kind of building our team. And uh, I'm just, I'm curious as to see if others will follow suit. They probably planned out the holy shot too. They were like, hey man, you've just <laughs> got to like throw in for the best shot ever thrown in the history of disc golf. This and that'll great. We'll have enough <laughs> money. You can have the fans know what the script, dude. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have enough yeah, money to go out and go out and sign Simon. This would be great. This would be great. So, um, do, do, do Simon and James, or I guess any of the MVP guys really promote the streamlined discs at all? Or is it more just the, the, the MVP discs and the Axiom discs? I think, I think time, I, I think Simon's time-lapse is streamlined. Okay. Yeah. I don't really follow it. But... I, I, I believe it is. So I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure there's no, uh, there's no rim on the, on his, I don't think so. No. Okay. Um, I think. Uh, I think. Well, then if he's streamlined, then that doesn't leave room for. Then what's Eagle? What's Eagle gonna throw? Well, I think. I think there is some like obviously a little bit of like, hey, we're over here, we're over here. People yeah. are saying no, it's Axiom. Okay, so uh, yeah, I guess. I guess everything is Axiom for Simon. Um, okay. I, I was. I was wrong on that. Oh, it. It is. It is like. It is colored. We threw it. I think, at, yeah, uh, I think it's multicolored. Yeah, we threw it at um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it is it is Axiom. Yeah, we threw it at um. Which we call it? At MVP, in that video. Oh. That that's when he like we literally we saw oh, him right. throw it for like the first we time on hole one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So I don't know. We'll we'll see kind of how this works out and how it plays out. It'll be very interesting to kind of. I mean, again, this is all speculation. We don't know where Eagle's going, but you know, if we're lo if you're looking at what Dismania has been doing the last few weeks, it really seems like they're kind of, hey, we've got Eagle for a few more weeks here. Let's try to get as much out of him as possible. That's what it kind of seems like. Um, they're really the only ones that, you know, like Discraft's not really reaching out to us to be like, hey, we need you guys to start promoting this video and do this and do. They're not really like crunching us on a timeline right now where it seems like Eagles putting out a lot of stuff for them. So um, I think, he, I think they just said something about the P2 today. I think he's in a video talking about the P2. Yeah. Oh, something, man? Something, 
Yeah, I was going to touch on two things. These are a little while back, but I thought they were kind of fun to say. Uh, the first one is you're talking about how like uh, players are all announcing where the how they're moving, but not like where they're going. And I think that that's just a really good like marketing thing where like at the end of the season, you know, in December, you'll announce, hey, I'm leaving this team. And then, you know, January 1st, you're going to see tons of people being like fresh year, fresh me. Here's my new start at this company. Do you so think I that's think what's that, happening here, though? I, I do. Um, I think a lot, I would be surprised if you had some of these players leaving their company and just saying they're leaving before having anything going, you know, somewhere else. Well, that, what, that would well, surprise me. Well, qu well, question. If, if this, if this crap would have came to you this off season and said, Hey, Aaron, listen, we love what we're, you're doing. Um, but you know, we're just not able to give you the same deal next year as what you have now, you know, we're going to be able to only pay, we're going to pay you 10% less. Uh, we're not going to do as many runs for you, but we still want you on board. Are you taking that or are you saying like, I'm going to risk it and see what else is out there? So in this hypothetical situation, I would probably say to Discraft, you know, this is what you want to hear is, you know, I, I would prefer to part ways. I'm going to go somewhere else. That's what I tell Discraft. But then I'm not going to post anything until I have a company that is like, hey, we want you here. And as no, soon what as somebody, if, what if the company posts it? Now, if oh, the okay, that's if the a little different. But if the company posts it, is that kind of lead us to believe that they were just told the person we're not interested in resigning you at all? Right? Because like, like you just said, right. if you were like, "Hey, I don't, I'm not going to resign with you guys. I'm going to go elsewhere." You're saying like, "I'm not going to make a post until I know what's going on." Yeah, that, but that, that's if, kind of the world I live in. But if you walked. Yeah, if you walked into Discraft and be like, "All right, I'm ready for renegotiations. Uh, what are we doing?" and they're like, "Yeah, we're we're not interested." You're not gonna go and being like, "Guys, I'm leaving Discraft. I'm out." Right? You're probably gonna like be like, "Crap, I need to figure out where I'm going." So if the company right. posts, if the company makes a post being like, "Hey, we're sad to see Gooseman go. He was awesome on the team." Does that lead us to believe like it was more on the company side and not on the player side? That's an, you just brought that up. I never even thought about that. It's a good point. I don't think I've ever seen a company do that. I think that anytime I've seen a company say, hey, we're so sorry to see so-and-so go, it's after the player has already come out with the same post. I think so many times mm -hmm. you'll see that. Um, I think, I, you know what I mean, where like someone will post like, hey, like Paul, he'll be like, hey, I'm leaving Innova, you know, so sorry, we've had some great memories. And then right after he posts that, Innova will come back and be like, thank you so much for being on our team. You know, we've got tons of respect for you. So I, I've never actually seen the company go first, but then again, I don't keep track of a lot of things. So it yeah, may happen all the time. It's tough. It's tough to know exactly what, who posts first, but I'm saying, I'm wondering if, if there are people out there, we have a, a lot of people that listen to this podcast. Let's do some investigating, go look around and see who's posting first. What's happening. Is someone having to post because someone else posted? That would be kind of an interesting most, way. I think most of the time it probably is like the correct order of events. But I, didn't uh, something happen with Matty O like two years ago when he went to West, si West Side? Well, like, I think yes. maybe Prodigy released something like way too soon and people got pissed off and stuff. So mm -hmm. I think it does happen. And then I, 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 I don't know. I guess I would assume that as far as people leaving sponsorships now, I think it probably happens both ways. Well, sometimes it's the playoff saying this isn't going to work for me. And sometimes it's the company just saying, listen, we can't afford you anymore. Like, I, Honestly, I think the economy is kind of tough right now for, for companies and disc golf's not maybe growing as fast as it was two years ago. And so those, those are some setbacks. So it's kind of a tough, kind of a tough season for transferring sponsorships. And, and I, would, least. I would say it's never like one side or the other. Um, I think it's the, that mutual, right. it's a contract, you know? So it's like if Discraft came to yep. me and said, Hey, you know, we can't pay you any money, but we'll put you back on a structure where we'll, you know, we'll pay your entry fees and give you bonuses. If you win tournaments, you know, hundred allotment for the year then I would be like, hey, I can't do that. I got to go find somewhere else. So at the end of the day, you know, Discraft's offering me less and I want more and that just doesn't match up. So then I would go somewhere else. But, you know, the same thing could be true on the other end where I'm like, hey, I won, you know, three tournaments last year. You need to pay me more. And they're like, hey, we can't afford to pay you any more, but we'll give you the exact same salary as last year. Again, I might go somewhere else. But it, to me, it's, it's the, the mutual you know, it's, it's contract, you know, between two, two different seconds. entities. Yeah. Right. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. I mean, I kind of, I kind of had this idea that 
some of these contracts for certain players were a little bit maybe inflated for what their value actually was and these companies at that time like any you put anyone's name on a disc and it was selling and so mm -hmm. maybe there was this idea a little bit of like holy cow we've got let's sign this guy let's sign this guy and now i think we're starting to see a little bit more of wait a second this is actually what makes sense and so there might be some kind of realization of where if you're like the 20th guy in the world and you know what the 19th guy in the world is making and uh but he signed their contract a few years ago and you're like well i'm i'm gonna go find that and you go out there mm -hmm. you're like it, it might not be out there anymore like there might be yep. a little bit of a we're kind of falling back into where we're at so it'll be interesting i see um as would definitely let us know when tristan comes in if he if he has anything yeah, to we, say, I, we hype him up. He's gonna feel pressure to. Well, I guess he's probably not watching this. He like, he probably doesn't know, but he's he's gonna like no, feel pressure no to idea. make the announcement. He has no I, I got I got something to say about Tristan too. Um, I I think this is kind of interesting. Um, I'm surprised he's leading Latitude myself, um, because I played with Tristan in Colorado, and I remember this season that he played, where he went from like an 880 player to a 980 player in one year and the amount of work he put in and he only threw latitude and like he posted every single tournament he he was like the most committed person i've ever seen at 880 that is just like mm -hmm. i am going to get sponsored by latitude and it's going to be that company and i'm going to make it happen and he grinded hard all year long and i think he went on tour the very following year sponsored by latitude so oh. um it was an interesting thing because like I saw that whole progress of him like working to like get that sponsorship and it was exactly what he wanted, you know, the company he was looking for and all the work he put in. And so it, it's interesting to see him make that post of he's he's moving away from it. But I, I guess everybody's got their got it, well, you know, everything well, if, changes. Again, what if this was like Latitude's decision of like, hey, we're you know, house to disc being like, Hey, we want Latitude to be more of our international brand. Right. Mm -hmm. We're going right. to, we're going to be signing more of it. I mean, what if Discraft Aaron was like, Hey, everyone under six feet, we're not signing anymore. What would happen? What would happen to you? Hey, man, I'm six <laughs> feet tall. Like what, what would happen to you? Let me some slack, bro. <laughs> oh, it was the balloons. <laughs> <That's always. laughs> uh, yeah. So, so yeah, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was this thing of where he, and maybe we'll see him land with the dynamic disc or land with the West side, someone, or who knows, like you said, Ezra, Dismania is on the t on the uh, still under there. Castaplast is still under there. Um, who knows? We'll kind of see see how it. Yeah, all I wonder how that works too. Out. As far as like if 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 the house the disc wants to shift players around within their own kind of ecosystem, or if you get right. cut from one team, they don't want you on any team at all. You know, and I, I think ideally for for most of us, we would like to stay with one sponsor throughout the entire career. I think that's probably the ideal situation. But unfortunately, sometimes stuff just falls apart. And it's not, not necessarily anything to fear us about it. It's just, you know, sometimes parting ways is the only uh, good option. Right. Uh, as far as the shifting people around, too, it would be really interesting if, like, Eagle went to MVP and then they bumped, you know, Conrad over to Streamline. If they were just like, hey, we're just going to mm -hmm. switch things up a little bit, you know, like put our top guy at a different company where it's like a better fit, where all three players are right where they, you know, need to be with their discs. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Time will tell. All right, we got the wild story of the week here. So this is uh these are these are stories that are submitted to us on social media, sometimes in the comments. I guess we need to have Silas. I think we may maybe create like a email that people can submit their stories at some point. Um, some of these stories we also take off of the off season, which is another podcast here on the Foundation Podcast Network. So this one starts off like this. So off the tee on this particular hole, you need about 80 feet to clear a small but deep pond. I clear it easily, but then some random passerby sees it land and starts walking towards it. She picks it up and waves to me where I'm still on the tee, uh, where I'm still on the tee since there's others in my group waiting to tee off, but now they can't sense she's in the middle of the fairway. Anyway, she walks towards the pond and yells, here's your Frisbee back. She completely whiffs the throw and it goes right in the pond. Afterwards, oh she just God. gives me an oops, sorry, and then walks off like nothing happened as me and my group stand there dumbfounded. The disc was never seen again. It's been a while since this, uh, so I can laugh it off uh, now, but still ridiculous. Have you guys had any That's of these impressive. stories of like, because the problem is the Frisbee is, is very similar to like a soccer ball. 
or a basketball or a football of where if I'm just like, or volleyball, if I'm just kind of like walking by and a soccer ball comes out of nowhere and I see people running at me, I'm like, oh, here you go. And, and I kick it back, right? The Frisbee is like that as well. Like, oh, that was a bad throw by someone. Oh, no worries. Here you go. I can throw it back to you. Disc golf, though, isn't like that. And so there no, are these she, she was doing. Yeah. She tried to throw that disc in the lake. She was being the fear. Oh, yeah, she tried to do that for sure. I, I, don't she get was I think you got to question who was on that card with you and how much they wanted to win. Because I, I think <laughs> one of his buddies was like, hey, here's five bucks. Just go throw that buddy, my buddy's disc right in the center of that lake. Call this it good. Is, this is his go-to driver. We need to get rid of it ASAP. <laughs> yeah. Oh, That's man. a big score. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I would, I mean, there's been plenty of times where people are walking towards your disc and the problem of like being like, if I'm 200, 300 feet away, me yeah. saying like, no, stop. Also very right. much looks like, Hey, that's my disc. Throw it to right. me. Like th those are very yep. similar kind of uh, motions. So I can totally see how people kind of get confused by that. But yeah, if you guys have any stories, I guess we'll create an email at some point. I'll probably get maybe David to do that and sift through them. Uh, and we'll throw them up on here. All right, let's talk about the All Star Weekend, boys. Uh, either one of you guys packing your bags? You just you bring it up, you know, and you just you know the answer, Brody, and you bring it up anyway, you know. Go Gooseman, you're packing your bags? I am packing my bags. I'm headed. Oh, I'm, headed there. Oh, I'm going for it. I did it. I didn't know you were. I didn't know you were in. I was. That was a legitimate question. I didn't actually know if you guys were both in or not. Um. I actually just got into it. I just got an email that oh, said that Simon's dropping out and I get to take the last spot. So. Whoa, breaking uh, news, yes, Aaron. I don't you know gotta, when I'm supposed to tell anyone this or gotta, if I'm supposed to. You got you to leave with like, that. What, what do I do, man? You got to so leave with the breaking spot. news. Let's go. Wow. Okay. I knew very, you were first on the cool. list. So I knew if someone did drop, I knew it would be you. So that's cool. How, yeah. how did you know I was first on the list? Ezra always hey, well, pays I attention. Okay, you know, okay, okay. I pretend gotcha. like I don't know anything. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I know it's Jeff. Sometimes Jeff Spring wonder, talks to me directly and tells me exactly what's going on. If you guys, yeah, attention. have someone whispering in your ear, or I'm just completely clueless and have no idea what's going on ever. But I got that out of nowhere because I was like, man, I would have thought, you know, like you probably <laughs> would have been the alternate instead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you gotta be full expectations, man. No, I think they, I think they released something because they were saying that Paul McBeth was like fourth in line. So I think that like maybe Stan oh, Mando okay. or the so, something posted something and said like, oh, he's fourth in line. So then they also showed who was next in line. Yeah. So, so we, uh, <laughs> we were speculating. They, they announced the All Star teams, the first team, second team. Is there a third team too, or is it just first and second? There might be a third too, actually. It would be well, there, was, yeah. there was the yeah. top four, and then there's like first card, second card. It's the way they phrased it, okay. I think. So okay. there's 12 total players for men and women. Yeah, so me and uh, Yuli speculated that Paul wasn't in the All-Star event because he probably dropped himself from it, right? But when that list posted, the li what the list showed is it showed um, your placement of like where you are on the All-Star, like one, two, three, and that was a combination between like your actual performance and then a fan vote a or sorry, a media vote, whatever you want to say. So those two things oh, accounted, accounted for it. And so we thought, you know, obviously Paul didn't have the season to actually get in performance wise, but we just thought his fan vote would push him in and right, his fan, too. his, his fan vote was 13th. So um, he, he wasn't in performance wise and wasn't in, and then the fan vote wasn't big enough to get him in there. So that's, that's where that list kind of came from. So you could actually kind of see how some people dropped and some people kind of got, you know, someone like uh, Ezra Robinson, like his performance wasn't good enough to get him in, but he had a massive fan vote or media vote. And that's what put him in there or I at least, or, or at I least think the pushed, top 12 made it like the, or at least the... pushed him the exact top 12 were the exact 12 that made it into it. So it might've made him, it might've made him that he was supposed to be on third, second card or whatever. He's on first card. Like oh, it, it, it moved, yep. he moved up the right. list. Uh, uh, I think he, I think he was the biggest mover based off of the media fan vote. So I gotcha. Um, you got a good name. What can you expect? Yeah. <laughs> That's, I love uh, the way they do it with uh, they do it partially on your placing and partially on the, the media vote. I think that's a really great way to do it because then you get someone like Paul who, you know, if he comes in at 15th, you know, he's definitely in. Um, and, he, you know, that's who the players want to see. But you also get this situation of, hey, these top 12 players, people like them. You know, we're going to have the top 12 players. Yeah. So we have uh, 
we have like a they're basically gonna do the same thing as they did last year where they're gonna have a doubles team event and then a singles team event and based off of you know who wins that that wins the all-star of i don't even know who the team captains are yet but the thing that they are changing this year which i think is going to be a good change is the skills challenge so the skill challenge this year uh is going to be returning but the skills challenge will not actually go towards team points. It's going to be actually all individual based um, skill challenges. So you have putting distance and accuracy, and you're going to end up having a individual winner for each one of those. And they're also going to be adding players that aren't invited to the all-star event. So someone like an Ezra, uh, we, we know Ezra does really well in distance contest. They might invite Ezra to the distance oh, contest nice. for the all-star event, right? Or someone like an Andrew Marweed. They might invite Andrew Marweed to the putting. So they're going to pull people that aren't in the actual top 12 all-stars that are very specific to that genre. And this is obviously very similar to like what the NBA does right? You have some guys that are in the three point contest that aren't all stars. You have some guys that are in the slam dunk contest that aren't all stars. So I think this will spice it up a little bit. What are your guys' thoughts on that? I absolutely love it. I think that this is, I talked to Steve Dodge about this a little bit at the end of last season, and we were trying to come up with the perfect event to do this kind of challenge. And we're like, it's gotta be all stars. And it's just like a showcase. People just want to see people, you know, do well. So I think this is a great opportunity to do all those skills challenges, you know, invite Wiggins, you know, for the distance, like he's not really a touring player even, but like, then you get this more specialized thing of like, you know, you can have players that where their focus is putting and they might be able to get enough fame from putting or distance or accuracy to the point that they can pay a salary, you know, get through the season without, you know, being a top touring player. So I think it adds a lot of diversity and it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Real quick, this segment is now sponsored by Brian H. Shout out to Brian H. They just gifted five TLC memberships right here. So shout out to Brian H. Let's go. Um, go ahead, Thank Ezra. You. Oh, uh, yeah, I love it too. I think it makes it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we 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 talk about like when the when the World Championships comes around, and we have the the distance contest and the the skills chart challenge, the putting contest. A lot of the times like when I talk to people, it's it's always the, the consensus is always we kind of need it, its own event for these event for these events because when we go to the, that tournament, we're trying to play that tournament, so our focus can't really be, you know, some of those field events to where when you put it for the all stars, I think it's gonna be a lot easier to kind of dial in those certain events. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And the one thing I will say, what are your guys' thoughts on the timing? This is the week before the first event on the disc golf pro tour it's at the same course that the disc golf pro tour will start with do we like the timing of the all-star event because to me it seems like the timing in an, in a, in an ideal world the timing would be completely different but this is it seems very much like this is when the disc golf pro tour it would make the most sense for them they wouldn't have to spend as much money going to some event somewhere else in the middle of the season. Um, what are your thoughts on like the actual timing of it and it being at the same course that we're going to see the next weekend? So I feel I, like it would make, I feel like it would make more sense if it was at the end of the season, you know, so you kind of, you kind of almost finish it with the all-star event instead of having it in the beginning of the season. Cause it's kind of odd how we have the 2023 all-star event in 2024. I feel like, I feel like it would make more sense if it was actually at the end of 2023, as kind of a bonus event to cap the season off. Yeah, I, I totally agree with both of you there. I think that the timing is a little bit weird and it probably is done just to be very simple. It's really convenient for the pro tour to like get everything going to, um, it gets, you know, the fans appetites whetted, you know, for the season to start, but, uh, the best timing would be sometime in the off season because there's just so low engagement of your fans that it's a great opportunity to just throw it out there and maybe end in November. I don't know. So sometime like that, put it in a really nice place like Florida where the weather's always great year round. And then that way you can like have this midway through the off season kind of like break for everyone where they get their dose of disc golf. This person makes a sling, uh, sling and diss makes a good point. They say everyone is rusty beginning of the year. It's that 
that is true, right? Like it does take some, it does take some people to kind of get back into the swing of things just a little bit. You also have some people like if you're Eagle, Eagle Eagle's going to you know I think if he does end up switching, he's he's going to get better throughout the season just because he's getting used to his disc, he's getting his disc more dialed in. So, and I know Ezra's going to hate it because he's going to be like, I don't believe in rust, but. Um, you know, there are players that, take, yeah, there are some players that definitely takes, it takes a little bit of time to kind of get back into the swing of things and they might not be shooting on all cylinders versus like you were saying, Ezra, if you do it at the end of the season, yeah, I guess, I guess I think, the question is there is like, are people just over it at that point of where there's like, I'm the season's over. I'm done. I don't want to yeah. do anything else. I think the playoffs are definitely over at that point. And the playoffs definitely want to go home. But I think the main focus should be the people watching, since that's kind of the people who end up subscribing and paying the bills in the false place. I think I like what Goose said about having it sometime in the middle of the offseason. The only problem is I think if people do take take the offseason off, then you will see that rust, which, again, starting off the season with the rust is like the – I feel like you should be your freshest and you'll, you'll, you should be finding the most. You've had three months to, like, dial in everything and get ready for the next season. I feel like that should be the least rusty time. But uh, that aside – um, I think the middle of the off season would be good as far as like, you know, kind of getting people excited about disc golf again, when there is so much downtime, so I think, I think that could be something that, be, that could be implemented. But I think at the end of the season would probably make the most sense, especially logistically for the pro tour, since they'll already kind of have all those assets at the last event. They could just do it in Charlotte or something, you know, what the last event is. Yeah. As far as the rust goes, um, one of the things I want to say is I probably won't have any rust like you're saying because i'll get a lot of like uh, practicing going uh these next you know month and a half or so but i'm super excited to have the all-star event before the actual first event of the year to where to put that like uh pressure rust i i don't know if that makes sense you yeah. just have absolutely yeah. no pressure for like four months and so i'm really looking forward to having a situation where i can be competitive and really like feel those nerves and get back into the flow of things of playing with the top guys yeah, there's uh, definitely, yeah, there's yeah, definitely, there's definitely a, a little bit of that that is, it, it takes a little bit of time to get back into it. But I think some people use the idea of like rust in the sense of like team sports, of where playing, playing a team sport where you're like going up against your own teammates and practice and stuff is very different than going up against an actual team. So those first few. Be. Yeah, those first few games, that is definitely takes some time for some teams to kind of get into the swing of things. Or if you go into like fighting, right? If you take a full year off of fighting and you haven't been, you know, sparring people in the gym, it, it's not the same as getting someone in there that wants to rip your head off. And so I, I can see that, but I, I'm with you there, Goose. I think our sport, it's definitely more of the, man, I haven't had a putt that actually like really mattered in a few months. Yeah. Like this is, this is going to take a little bit of time to kind of get back into the swing of things. I agree That's with you point. on that. As far as That's the games point. go too. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. But as far as the games go, um, I really like the aspect of having all these different games and the all-star event is the only event throughout the year where we see doubles. So if we're going on the same line of having the all-star event be something that breaks, you know, it up in the off season, I'd love to see a world doubles championship in the same thing. Pick your, bring your own partner. You can have all kinds of divisions with it. I think that's one thing we're lacking in our sports is this, this uh, fun style that tons of us play all the time that we just have no professional outlet at the top level. And, It'd be so nice to just have some teams where you're like, have a player that compliments another player super well. And because of that, they just dominate, um, you know, because of the, the chemistry you have between the two players. So I don't, I, I don't I think even think that. you, I don't even think you make it like a world championship. I don't think you make it actually a big event. I think you make it like a fun event. I think you make okay. it to where people take the pressure away. You know, obviously people are still out there trying to win and whatnot, but take the pressure away. I think you'll get a lot more teams to show up and it, it could be a really fun event for a lot of the fans and spectators. And like you were saying, it's a completely different kind of style of disc golf as well. Um, I, I just think that would be a good, I don't know where you would hold it, right? Have it in Nashville, have it in Austin, right. <laughs> have it somewhere where people can actually get to. 
Uh, but I think people would show up to that event. I think that would be a cool event. Yeah. If it was if it was sold as fun, I think that would probably walk too. Because you know, people, the people that all take the off season off wouldn't care as much about being rusty or whatever it is. I think on the rust note too, uh, some players that have injuries typically like do the soldiers and stuff. Like Paul's going through some stuff right now, I guess. And that's like the off season, a great time to do that. Obviously, you can't bend the two all to those in you know you know the small percentage of playoffs that have to deal with that kind of stuff. But it is something to think about. Yeah, that's actually true as well. Yeah, a lot a lot of people that are going through stuff. And just playing through it, they they use the off season and kind of rehabilitate themselves back to a little bit, hundred percent. All right, I don't know if you guys caught it. Trevor ended up losing a punishment a few weeks ago, and had to do a twenty four hour live stream where he played Minecraft. My mom told me that. <laughs> the, que- That's the, that. the question to you guys is: If you had to do a twenty four hour live stream, what activity would you pick? Oh my gosh. So um, I just got to throw it out there. Um, I'm a League of Legends player. So I've definitely played 12 straight hours of League of Legends before. So I probably could do 24 hours. But I don't think I'd want to stream it because I don't know if you've ever played a game like that. You get so <laughs> tilted and you get on a losing streak. I'm just going to be saying things that I don't want anyone else to hear. <laughs> so I don't know. It's give and take there. But I think I could do 24 straight hours of League of Legends. It would just be brutal. But Goose, if that's the if that's the mindset you get into, that's what people want to watch. That's what, like I would tune in at hour yeah. seventeen and be like, okay, how's the rest of this stream gonna go? He's, <laughs> he's sleep deprived. He's getting a little loopy. He's losing some matches. Like, what's what's gonna come oh, out? Oh man, that's what I would watch for. My parents walk in my room sometimes and they'll just hear me like mashing on my keyboard and just be like, ah, why? That you guys are all so bad. That sounds awesome. Do you have a headset, Goose? Are you communicating with the other people? Um, sometimes I, I'll invest that much, but most of the time I just like mute the chat and everything. And I'm just like <laughs> in my own zone. I'll like unmute it briefly to be like, Hey man, that was really bad. You should like shape up, <laughs> but uh, you should I, uninstall I brother. <laughs> I hate you. That's not what I said. Uh, Andrew, you, what, what activity are you doing for 24 yeah, hours? I don't know what I would do. I mean, it almost has to like, it almost has to be like a video game thing. Like anything that's active. It's almost start. impossible. Even if it was disco, you couldn't disco for 24 hours. You would die. C- circle one uh, putts, man. You should do a circle one putts 24 hour stream sometime. I mean, Tyrone, couldn't do it. Maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe like, uh, maybe like a travel, like you travel for 24 hours straight, you know, or not travel, but like you explore a new city. You'd have to have buddies. You have to have like buddies probably so that, that make it easier. So then they can like cycle off who's like with you. And what are you doing at four be- o'clock in the morning? You're just in a bar? With the you're live the stream? Tokyo. No, you're in the middle of Tokyo at 4 a.m. Stuff. It's popping. Oh, okay. Stuff's going on. Oh. So, so you could do like a, like, yeah. I didn't buy an Airbnb tonight. So I yeah. just have to like, <laughs> I just, I'm going for 24 straight yeah. hours with nothing. I'm never, I don't have a home base. I'm just, Fair, I'm bring just a bunch of battery packs. <laughs> I want to be a future YouTube idea. I'm to do that. Yeah. A bunch, a bunch, bunch of battery packs. Um, yeah. The easy one for me would obviously be risk. Because some of those games already take like three, four, five hours. So I might only have to play like six games and I'm good. But the one that I think would be more interesting would be blackjack. And I would start, oh I would oh start God. with like a thousand dollars and I would play like five dollar hands of blackjack. And if I ever ended up like losing everything, I would have to do punishments on live stream to get donations from the chat oh, okay. to, then, I like that. to then be able to get money back in to get me going again. I was that, would say, be, that would be like the, that would be like the punishment on punishment of like, I, I can't, I can't restart until I eat an entire bowl of uh, SpaghettiOs to get, to get $20 <laughs> um, more to be able to yeah. start gambling again. That I would like be, it. that would be a wild stream. I think. When you start, that'd be so monotonous though. The backtrack for twenty four hours straight, cool. like that's, I think that's the big, like one of the biggest struggles with any of the, any anything would be like League of Legends for twelve hours, for twenty four hours. It'd be easy. Anything would be so monotonous. I feel like. I think I could. Uh, poker's a good one, man. Poker I, would be a good one. I think I could one. play Texas Hold'em Probably for twenty four straight hours. The only issue is the losing the money. I think I could lose a thousand dollars in blackjack, even betting five bucks at a time. In very one hour. quickly oh like, yeah no, like it would take sure. me one hour to be completely broke 
playing perfect blackjack. I've seen it happen before. You know, it's like it. The problem with poker is like you, if you're not playing for money after maybe right. a few hours are kind of fine. But then after that, you're just kind of like going all in when it doesn't even matter. What about, I don't know if you guys have been noticing. I've, I started a new hobby uh, where I'm opening cards. So I'm like, oh, I'm doing, I'm yeah, doing some, terrible. doing some card collecting. I could, I could open 24 hours worth of, uh, of, of sports cards. I could do I that. that I mean, dude, some of these boxes we're buying are like $600 for a box of cards. <laughs> we just opened, I don't, I don't understand it. we just opened a thousand dollars worth of boxes yesterday. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a weird though. one, but right. to me, it's, it's a, well, the bad investment. Like, if you're go if you're doing it for an investment purposes, then it's not a good idea. Well, I guess you wouldn't you wouldn't be opening boxes. You'd be like you'd probably be like trading calls to hoping they go up in value and stuff. You yeah. know what I'm getting? Yeah, yeah, okay. because because majority of these boxes you pay six hundred dollars with, you're lucky to get three hundred dollars in value out of them, right? Um, so the the real thing is like I, scratch offs are fun every now and again, right? Where it's just like, eh. but like this is like really fun and me and my brother used to go ham on pokemon cards back in the day so it's kind of bringing <laughs> it's bringing a little bit of that back so we'll see how it goes um do you guys have do you guys have cards do you guys know if you're are you doing cards with uh disc golf pro tour or brixton yeah i did both oh, yeah both yep yeah. Oh yeah, you're shaking yeah. your heads. So you're th you're thinking I was asking if you had Pokemon cards over there. Yeah, I'm right. talking, you you're asking Pokemon. for the card collecting, and I was like, no way, bro. Oh. Horrible. Hey, yeah, Goose, uh, I don't a, hate you for saying that. Hey, man, he already knows that. <laughs> uh, it'd be a good YouTube video, though, dude. We'll have to do a uh, how long can we play disc golf for? So like, get like mm. a pitch and putt course. You know, like everything's like 150 feet, and then just be like, how many holes can we play? Do we get golf calls? Golf cards, <laughs> because that would make a, that would make an insane difference. Good Maybe question. call in to get the drinks every now and again. But Can we throw left-handed too, man? I think we'd have. I I think I'd have to switch to the left-handed for a while too. I mean, if you're only using one disc too, not carrying a bag, that also helps a lot. Oh, a good lot. point. Sure. I think I think I could do it for a while, honestly. Um, but that'd like be an interesting holes. one. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Uh, uh, I got a, bu a buddy, uh, Mike. Uh, he like set the record on the number of holes played or, or rounds played or something in a day. And I was like, oh, it was some disgusting amount of like, I don't know, it was like a thousand rounds on like nine holes. Yeah, they, and, they, I mean, you could just like not practice for three months, then and you'll be set. Chat, chat saying that the uh, <laughs> the the world record was set for twenty four hours. So I think that's what the world record is actually okay. right now. Someone did it. So. We got to break it. That's the, that's the, that's the goal then. Yeah. Okay. 2,900 holes. 2,900 oh, holes. Yeah. Wow. No. Yeah. Jeez. That, that right. seems, that seems a little bit. Or something? It's a lot of freaking holes, man. It's a lot of freaking holes. All right. No. Let's talk Simpsons. Do we have any Simpsons? You guys, Simpsons fans? You guys watch the I've Simpsons? Seen, I've now. seen the memes. I've seen the memes. So That's about it. The Simpsons uh, did a little shout out to Disc Golf. A little shout out to Ken Climo. So yeah, they cool. they've got uh, they got Homer here throwing off, and they've got two signs in the back round. One of them says Gordy's Frisbee Gloves for that non throwing hand, and then the other one says Frisbee Wax as used by Ken Climo the tiger woods of this. Um, so <laughs> it was a quick, a quick little shout out for the Simpsons. Always cool to kind of see disc golf in the wild. And uh, you know, I think this is one of those things of where if you are in disc golf and you play disc golf, when you see something like this, you freak out about it. And if you're not like you, like this is just like a, a non story, but for us, you know, disc golf is a very niche sport. So whenever it does get picked up, by a bigger media outlet or a big show like this, it's always a very cool thing to kind of see. All right, let's jump into some listener questions. You guys ready to answer some of these people's questions for you? Because we're going to start off with a spicy one to start right away, right away for Goose Man. Here we go. Goose, did you change your mind on Maple Hill? Oh, man. So should I share this? I, I had the perfect thing, man. 
I've, I, I'm going to be straight up with you guys. I did change my mind a little bit on the course. Um, I don't think it's the worst course um, that we play on tour. I still think it is not my favorite and not I- anywhere in the top half of courses we play on tour. But uh, the one thing it has that I really like about the course is it's hard. And we don't have too many courses on tour that are hard. So when you shoot over par your first round, you're immediately just out of the tournament. Is that because we were playing in 40 mile an hour winds, Goose, man? It could be. It could be that one (laughs) round. But I shot two over par the first round, and then I shot like nine down, eight down, eight down, and I took second place. So it's just so refreshing to have an opportunity to actually get back into the tournament. Versus at Jonesboro, I shot like 12 down the first round, and I shot five down the second round. And after that round... I was out of cash, I think. Like, I, I dropped from lead card to no longer within the cash with shooting five down. So I, it's just a completely different juxtaposition there. Um, I will give you this funny story. I've told Ezra this one before, and I, I'll just shout it out. But I wanted to win MVP so badly. And first of all, shout out, you know, Matteo, great job, great win. You deserved it the whole way. But if I had won the, the, the tournament and they came up and asked me and were like, hey, did you change your mind on uh, what, you know, on this course? You know, do you still think it's the worst course on tour? I would have said, what can I say? I just got lucky. <laughs> and that would be my whole response. The lucky shots, man. It's the lucky shots. <laughs> it's the lucky shots. <laughs> so that, that's oh. my take on Maple Hill. Um, but I like that uh, – that there's a lot of uh, thought put into the course as a whole. You know, I, uh, I talked for a long time with the, the course designers there. So um, I think we have a, a good connection and I, I appreciate a lot of the decisions he's made now that I've uh, listened to what his thought is on those decisions. Yeah. There's only a few courses like that on tour where we actually see changes year after year where people are, are trying to make the course more challenging, more score separation, more score separation. A lot of the courses we go back to and we're like, Oh, this was a par five last year. Now it's a par four. Like there's not, there's not really a lot going on there. So uh, that is one thing I do applaud MVP for doing every year is kind of pushing the envelope on course design and trying to get caught up with where the skill level is now. Ezra, did you have something to say about that or no? Nope. (laughs) Okay. Uh, all right. Next question. Van life or airport and Airbnb. I think we're rich. That's crazy. <laughs> airport. What's that? <laughs> yeah. I, the, the question should be more like van life or cars and Airbnbs would probably be a better. There's not too many people that are flying in and out of every tournament. Um, but both right. of you guys have done the living in your car, living in your van. What, uh, what kind of made you, I guess, switch from doing so into actually going into the Airbnbs or was it simply just a money situation? So it's a little bit of both for me, for sure. Um, I'm actually really thankful that I started with the car life. So like first year on tour, I slept in my Honda Civic and it was kind of like bare bones. You know, he did the Prius too. So he knows exactly what it's like living in the car. Next year, I actually converted over the Toyota Sienna, had more space, um, much more doable. And then uh, mainly it's the money um, that got me, you know, into the Airbnb life. It is way better. It is un- like night and day difference, but it does cost more money. And if you want the exact thing that made me switch, it's called, I played the Mid-America Open in that van, and it was 100 degrees, 100% humidity for seven days straight, and it got down to like 82 at midnight, or at five in the morning. That was the low. 82 is the low, and you cannot sleep in that, okay? I would run the AC in my car for half hour as hard as I could. It'd get freezing in my car, and then I'd go to sleep. (laughs) I'd wake up two hours later, and I'd have to do the same thing again. Oh. If you've never slept in 82 degrees, like, oh my gosh, it is not possible. And that's why I switched to Airbnb life. Did you ever sleep in the nude in your car? Just like, no oh, here's, clothes the on, just... Just... here's the thing, Brody. I yeah. never, I never locked my doors and I never had window covers. So like I, I was down to my underwear, but people can just like look in at me. <laughs> and I felt like I get a ticket or something like that for sleeping naked. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think the spicy question is spicy. Uh, <laughs> spicy. Now I, I can relate to you though a little bit, but my story is a little bit different. I was actually in Bali 
on the amazing race and we had to sleep outside okay. one night and it was it was the same thing it was like 90 degrees plus super humid and we're just sleeping outside and i'm like this is this is awful it's so, horrible yeah you, you you can't do anything when you, whenever you start feeling like the the sweat drips like fall down your body like you can actually just feel all the sweat just slowly falling all over your it's you're you're not going to sleep I've what's seen, it I had a little, negative Go. 10 before negative 10 you can deal with man just put no, on a sleeping that bag. hypothermia no, just put a sleeping bag on, a oh. blanket, you go right to sleep. I mean, like, you wake up frozen <laughs> to the side of your car in the morning or whatever, but, like, that's 10 times better than 95 at night. Oh, you just can't cool down. It's impossible. And your, your body temperature is, what, like, 98 degrees? So, like, it kind of wants to create its own little ecosystem inside the car to where, like, your body kind of makes its own heat. And then, yeah, so cold is definitely not as painful. I had, like, a little, like, a little uh, PC fan, that I plugged into a USB port, like a USB charger. So I could just have the fan out of my face and just, <laughs> that's kind of how I was able to sleep sometimes in the Prius. I do appreciate you guys not like, um, it, it, the Airbnb world would be a lot harder if all three of us were very different on temperatures of how oh, we like yeah. to sleep. Because it would, it, would be, it would be tough if we were constantly thermostat like, nah, 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 nah. But I you guys we, like the temperature we had last season? Or... It wasn't yeah. like way too hot for you guys. Or, oh. I, I think we're adding Tristan to the to the Airbnb though, so we might be in, in trouble now. I, Is he a hot I, guy? No, I shared a Airbnb oh. or I shared a hotel <laughs> well, with him one yeah, time, I mean... and he just cranked the AC all the way, and it was so cold. It was like fifty five degrees in our hotel See, room. I, that's so. That's just so dependent on what these Airbnb like. Sometimes it's just like a sheet. Like you don't even have like right, a, right. a thick a thick uh, thing. So like if it's yeah. that, then it's like I'm fine with like 68, 69, 70. But like, yeah, if he's cranking it down to 60, I might have to like I might have to pack a my own like comforter or something Blanket, or, a, yeah. or a sleeping bag. I might have to go great sleeping bag. Um, what made you change the decision, uh, Ezra? What, what made you go from Prius to Airbnbs? Oh, first of all, Tristan, Tristan and I have been showing a place for the last like month and a half, two months, and it's been like 69 the whole time. So it's like, oh, it has okay. to too bad. Cool. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what made me decide to change? You know, the pre I, I changed from the Prius to the RV, probably just because Dishcrafts, you know, we were able to walk that out. So that was, that was nice. The cost thing wasn't really a big issue because like living in a RV with a generator and all that stuff and gas, portable gas mileage, the cost actually ended up being somewhat similar, I think, for the RV versus the Airbnb. So it kind of just depends on how you have your contract worked out to have, you know, for that pay. Um, but I kind of wanted to mix it up. I kind of wanted to, yeah, kind of wanted to see if it was better, I guess. So I kind of wanted to try out the living in an actual house, having a little bit more nimbleness with an actual vehicle. And um, yeah, I mean, I think in the Airbnb route would be a lot nicer, but I just, I had some pretty tough um, housemates that made it difficult. So that kind of sucked. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm kidding. I think that is actually a big part of, I think, I think having good housemates though, makes it, makes it way, way easier to do. Cause I have, I have heard some stories from other people, you know, that maybe it doesn't work out as good. And there was just a difference of you know the, the way to live. Well, like you said, the temperature, you're whatever. Saying, you're saying pe not everyone on the pro tour are friends. No, come on. Yeah, not know. everyone gets along. Not no. Friends. no, no, let's just say this. Let's just say this. It's not even necessarily like not friends. It's just like, if, if, you know, one person hates having the same full dishes and one person that that's how they want to live or, you know, just, just those just people live different ways. And so it's like, if, if, if people don't, um, don't mesh, then it makes living together difficult. But I think it went pretty well last year with you guys. One thing that I will say, that, Aaron, you made a good point of where you're, you were saying like you're thankful that you started in the car world and then you kind of transitioned. It might be kind of similar in a way to where when you go to college, like if you just go, you know, if your parents are super wealthy and you just go straight into like your own apartment and you don't have a roommate and you don't have to deal with living in the dorms and what that all that stuff that happens, you might like lose a little bit of appreciation for it. And you might like lose some of like the social skills and like, honestly, just survival skills that you have to have living in a dorm. Um, it could be kind of the same. Now, obviously I, I never did the van life before, <laughs> but being on an ultimate Frisbee team, I mean, there was multiple times where you're having eight guys stay in a hotel room. And you know, if you're the bottom of the tone pole, you get like the couch pillow and maybe a towel and you have the floor and it's just like, 
So yeah. it was, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, dude. <laughs> Come on, you, you know how that how it goes sometimes. Oh, Ultimate yeah. Frisbee is so stingy, dude. We would show up to like tournaments and we we're like, wow, they don't have peanut butter for the bagels. It's like, bro, they gave us free bagels. Like, <laughs> why, why are we complaining about our condiments that we get to put on our spreads? Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 it'll be interesting to kind of see if disc golf ever gets to the point of where people are just coming on tour and getting massive contracts for some reason. I don't know how that would happen because we don't really have like a college football program or something where you can like be a massive person in the lower division, right? You kind of have to work your way up. So I don't really know if that would ever be an issue for disc golf. Yeah, you'd almost have to have like that silver series, like its own tool thing or college or some kind of thing. I do want to make a quick comment though. The only thing I have to say about what you just said, Brody, is you do not have to go to college to learn how to do laundry. That's all all I'm going to say. say, Going to college definitely teaches you a lot of things though. It's not, you don't, it does. You get more knowledge. It does, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily. Yeah. It does teach a lot of things, but a lot of things you don't want to learn. And then also, (laughs) uh, right. Right. I don't know. And then also a lot of things that you don't necessarily need to go to college too long. Granted, I've never been to college, so I can't speak completely, but from what I've seen from other people, I think a lot of it is, uh, it's just kind of fun. It's just a debate that Brody and I have had in the no, past. So it's, I just thought it's kind of funny. It's a up. good debate. And, and maybe I don't have the right perspective because I got scholarships. Like we weren't able to afford oh. school. We weren't able to afford it. So for me to go to school, I needed to get the scholarships. So yeah. I got, uh, t- and then, and then I ended up dropping out and losing all my scholarships and I had to pay to get my degree at the end, but it would be an interesting story uh, question of like, Hey, you have to pay $30,000 a year to go here. I don't know what my decision would have been if I didn't have those scholarships. Cause you're right. Like, I don't know. Scholarship I mean, makes it a lot. Yeah. Makes a lot, makes it make a lot more sense for sure. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a much easier transition kind of going that route than just being thrown out into the world yourself. So you might have gone straight into disc golf if you hadn't gone to college. No, no shot. <laughs> uh, would not recommend. Okay. Would not recommend. <laughs> My degree was in business for the person that Doc wanted to know in the chat. Business administration. All right. Uh Ezra, are you going the hair out? We we seeing we seeing uh we're gonna see the long hair is. again. I you know, I just I haven't gotten it cut. So I'm not I'm not sure if I'm saying that I'm I'm growing it out. I just haven't gotten it cut. So they kind of go hand in hand, but what I don't about- know. Did you uh, shave your face or your chest? Or are you growing that out too? <sighs> this has never been shaved. So, you know, once I hit puberty on it, then I'll have a, a nice go-to or a nice uh, mustache like you and a beard like Brody. But until then, I'm just a boy. I like it. All Wait. right, Aaron, let's talk about Colorado. You're playing at higher elevations out there. This This guy wants to know... Um, has that helped your game at all? And would you recommend if someone was serious about getting into disc golf, should they try to play at lower elevations? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a hindrance, especially now that I've been on tour. Um, it's hard to, uh, the, the number one thing I think is cold for me. Like Colorado is just so fluctuate, fluctuates so much in the weather that it's hard to get like a solid practice routine. Um, as far as the elevation goes, there's a couple big differences and it, there's, there's pros and cons to it. So the biggest one I'll say is that you can't, it's, it's hard to hyzer flip in Colorado. So there's these beautiful shots you'll see like Chris Dickerson throw or stuff like that, where they'll throw their shot nice and high on a good bit of hyzer and halfway through the flight while it's moving left, it'll flip over and then it'll start coming back right. And the only way to do that in Colorado is to throw a crazy flippy disc or throw it super, super hard. And it just, you don't get the results that you get down at sea level. So if you're looking for these nice smooth shots where you're shaping it and getting those things, I definitely recommend playing at sea level more. And if you want to be on the pro tour, I recommend playing at sea level because all the tournaments are there. The one thing I will say is every single Colorado player that I know of has unbelievable snap. Um, the only way to actually get some like glide out of the disc and make it shape the way you want it to is to throw really hard. So if you look at Joel Freeman, you look at Colton Montgomery, you look at Eagle, you look at myself, we all throw really hard and you can just hear the crack when the disc comes out of the hand. So, um, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a car out of thing, but it just seems to be a correlation. So we debunked this, uh, the other day, just 
just so for everyone to know the noise that comes out of your hand is solely based on your hand structure and your grip. Right. So I think, I think we almost need to actually come up with a new term. I think a lot of, I think a lot of people think like I'm not throwing hard enough because I'm not getting that noise, the snap. And the snap is literally just the sound that your fingers make when they hit your hand. And so we all know some guys that can do this and make a whole lot of noise. And like, if you hear me, I can't make any noise doing that. Um, and so I, it'd be interesting to kind of come up with a new, cause you you are right in the sense that the, we see some players, you know, amateurs and whatnot, when they throw, it kind of looks like they're just like lobbing, lobbing it out there. Right. They're just kind of, uh, and you're really saying like, get into it really kind of snap the disc. But I think people listen and hear like right. Silas Schultz. They hear like Drew Gibson. They hear these guys that have that noise after the disc leaves their hand and they get the wrong impression of what that actually is, why that's actually happening. And that's only occurring because of the way that their hand is, is uh, like literally the, I don't know. I don't know the science of like what fingers or what you like, if you need longer fingers or shorter fingers, but I know the way your hand, how your hand is, and also the way you grip the disc, that is what's creating it. Cause I can't, for the life of me, make any noise. And like, <laughs> try, it, try two finger power grip, man. You'll, you'll get a, you'll get a snap with that. Um, I totally agree with you. This, it is just the sound and it's just the easiest way to kind of uh, like express that to people. Cause it is um, like noticeable when you hear it, but um, you will see the way that some of these, like what I'm getting after is just the way that people yes. throw. And yeah. um, you'll see players like Silas where he has a much smoother motion in my opinion than some of the Colorado players versus Drew Gibson. I think Drew Gibson has more of that like altitude kind of throw where he just throws the crap out of the disc. And then when he gets down to like shorter shots, he does have much smoother thing, but his, his like distance shots, you just see that, that torque generated. And um, I think because the, the reason that that is a thing is because you need that torque in order for the disc to get the motion that you're looking for at sea level versus when you're at sea level, you can just throw a little flippier disc, be nice and smooth, and you can get um, you can get solid results. You can throw, yeah, like Greg Barsby is a good example. He throws nice and smooth. He can get these hyzer flips that go, you know, a good distance, and he can throw a long ways with that. But it, it, it's nowhere near the same like torque that some of the yeah like players like Eagle are putting on the disc. Are you buying? I saw you messing around with your hand, Ezra. Are you buying the uh, the the snap? Inconclusive. Okay. <laughs> I have, enough, I have not enough research. Yeah, the, the, only re- the, only, the only reason I know that is because, like, it, 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 I came to the realization because you, I would see some players, tech, the tech disc has honestly really helped that a lot because, again, when you think of snap, you think, like, they're creating a lot of spin on the disc. They're creating a lot of velocity, and there's people that have a lot of that noise, that snap, and they're throwing way slower way lower spin rates than people that have it. So that's why I started messing around. I was like, really the noise is literally the disc. And it also started too with another word that's used in in disc golf a lot, grip, grip locking. There is no such thing as grip locking at a high speed. You cannot actually release the disc when you want, uh, like you can't hold on to the disc and throw it behind you if you're throwing it really, really hard and be like, oh, I grip lock that. That grip locking only really happens at lower speed and that's because the disc is ripping out of your hand. None of us, when we're throwing, we're never thinking of like, let go of the disc now, right? That's never in our head. It's just trying to sync up the lower body and the upper body. And when you get that hit point, the disc just, flings out of your hand. You're not actually releasing the disc. And that's where I was okay, like, I, see what I, was you're like saying. I was like, if we're not re- at, at full speed, right? Um, this is, this is not when we're throwing 150 foot shots. Cause that's when we're actually releasing the disc. And that's when you actually could grip lock it right. because you are physically like opening your hand to let the disc come out because you're not throwing with enough velocity for it to be pulled out of your hand. The that's where, thing- that's where I came up with this realization. The one thing I would say on that is that even when you are throwing max speed, you can release early and late, and then it's quote-unquote like grip lock. 
but it's not your actual grip. It's just the fact that you've mistimed it and it's Correct. it's come out a little early, come out late, and you just grip use locking. the terminology. Yeah, grip yep. lock. Oh my gosh, these balloons. <laughs> Let's go. Hey. The majority of the time that people grip lock, it's because they move their upper body earlier than they're supposed to. Right. And so when they get to that hit point, their body is now pointing away from their target. And so the disc comes out right of their target and they go, oh, I grip lock that. When in fact, a grip lock really should mean like it stuck on your hand and it came out late. And you can really only do that at really low, slow speeds. So. There's some nuggets. Uh, Ezra, take those nuggets. Let me know because I know you're going to stir on those for a little bit. Um, we haven't we haven't had one of our oh. debates in a while, so I would love to hear you uh, after you give that some thought and come back to me and, and tell me what you think of it. I've already forgotten about it. Okay, perfect. So we'll All right. we'll Next question: What is the well, preferred what is the preferred disc weight for you guys? Um, I definitely go max weight all the time. I noticed for a while when I was messing around with lighter weight discs, 160, even some of the blizzard plastic that I would quote unquote grip lock more, but that's just because it would throw off my timing a little bit because the disc weight, um, changed things just slightly to the point where I was like, Oh, I don't quite know where it's coming out. So at this point I just get everything max weight. What, what, uh, what weight do you start seeing that? Do you see, like, if you, if you, if I hand you a 177 Buzz OS and I hand you a 174 Buzz OS, can you tell without seeing the stickers? Can you tell? Um, I think I could tell 10 grams. I think okay, if you so handed me grams. something 10 grams lower than what it was, I could tell so you the just one, based the on the weight. The 160s is what right. you're saying. Okay. I don't think I could tell the grip lock thing until it was like 175 all the way to 160, maybe 15 grams, something like that. I don't think I would really notice a difference in my throw. I would notice a difference in stability. I think that's the biggest thing. Going from like a 175 to a 170, a lot of times makes it that little bit less stable. And I'm, I'm looking for things to be as stable as possible most of the time. Ezra, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I go max weight all the time if I can, except for all distance contests. Then ideally it's like 160. But I mean, yeah, just like Alan said, if you use a lightweight disc, the disc comes through your power pocket and everything's so much faster because it's so much lighter that it just throws everything off in the throw. So it's just, yeah, it's creating inconsist inconsistency that we don't want. Yeah. So question I for you. Do you think that it would be worth, you know, how baseball, like when you're like lining up to bat, they'll put like a donut on their bat to like make it heavier. Yeah. Do you think that's something in disc golf that could correlate? Or do you think that would just throw off your timing too much? Or do you think it would build like more muscle? So when you had the, you know, lighter disc, it would come through faster, maybe exclusively for distance contests. Uh, maybe exclusively for distance contests. Although I would, I would probably go the other direction. I think if I was going to train for a distance contest, I'd, I would just practice with the lightweight discs. I think the difference maybe probably for disc golf versus baseball is disc golf is so aim oriented with timing. So it's like, it's not necessarily just a speed thing. It's if it's a lightweight or heavyweight, then you have a fast difference in the aim. So I feel like, I feel like sticking with the same is, is, I don't know. The most the most ideal i've also done a decent amount of videos with like super heavy super heavy discs right. <laughs> i've also done video with like some 104 gram discs and uh i, I don't think it's a great thing what's that the duct tape disc no nah. no nope. nope. that wasn't me <laughs> <laughs> so i don't i don't think there's any i don't think there's any benefit and then as far as like building the muscles i don't think muscles help that much as far as distance goes so i don't think i don't think building yeah, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think building building muscles with a heavy disc would be the way to do it. Okay, that's probably not the way to do it. But I do say think that building muscle for throwing distance contests does help because I will okay. notice that when I throw a ton of shots and I've just done that for like a week straight um, and mm -hmm. then I like start the tournament, um, just that, that like – that constant repetition of, of being like super fatigued from the number of shots I'm throwing, then I'll build up more strength and I'll feel like I'm throwing farther. Mm. You yeah. guys, right? I mean, there, there is some, there was obviously, yeah, I mean, there'll gotta be some benefit, I suppose. Cause like children can't throw it as far honestly as grown adults. Right. And obviously like limbs, like the limb length and technique and right. flexibility and stuff is all, there's so many things that go into it. So I guess on a small extent, it'd be interesting to see, you know, in, in 50 years, if 
disc golf distance competitions were viable for people to make a living off of to where you have some people specializing in that, like they have in golf, and then yeah, what those athletes would look like. It's, yeah, for a lot of the golf guys are all jacked. But like Jamie Sadlowski uh, or what is it, Kyle uh, – What's his, what's his last name? Those are like the two, like the two top guys, I think, for like the last like decade. They're not massive. Yeah, they're, they're not, not massive. massive. I mean, they're, they're, they're okay. in shape for sure, but they're not like they're not like juiced up move, and just. They can move quick. They can move quick. They can move very quick. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I just I just looked up. I did some speed training in golf, and so they sent three different uh, clubs, if you will. And there's different weights at the at the end, and I was like, I, I can't remember exactly what the weights were, so I just looked it up. They give you one that is 20% lighter than your driver, then they give you another one that's 10% lighter than your driver, and then they give you one that's 5% heavier than your driver. And mm. the I didn't even put up two fingers. And <laughs> I love that. The balloons are killing me. Our audio listeners are like, stop with the balloons. So if I can remember correctly, I don't remember. I don't remember if I start heavy and I go light or I start light and I go heavy, but there was some sort of like, this is kind of the, the way to go about it. And so I would say that's probably what I would think would make the most sense for disc golf is you would have a little bit light of a disc and then a super light disc and then a little bit of a heavier disc. And then you would mess around with those to increase your, uh, your it is, speed. It is interesting that they sent you clubs more on the light side than on the heavy side. Like they barely went any heavy at all. Yeah. Which I think that probably goes to just training your body to move fast. It's kind of like when people will go play yeah. around at a super easy course and try to body out like 15 holes in a row just to kind of get their mind used to boarding holes and getting on these hot streaks. So that's, that's yeah. interesting. Right. Yeah. And sprinting, they do the same thing where they'll put you on a like uh, bungee cord yep. and they'll just get you used to running fast because then you'll just get shot faster than you can actually run. So you'll just get used to like what it's like when your body moves that quick. I'm 100% thing. trying that with my kid. I, I think it was a completely scam of a video. I don't think it was real, but this guy claimed in this video that he got his kid to learn how to walk just by holding holding their arms up so their feet are barely on the ground uh, and then he would he would walk real fast so that the uh his toddler would like walk kind of and then he and then he like let go and the kid just walked perfectly and i was like i think that's a scam i think the kid already knew how to walk but i'm going to definitely try it because uh if that could work that would be absolutely electric <laughs> Were you the one saying that you could you could have a kid think a carrot is a is a reward? I'm pretty sure that was you. Are you talking to me or Aaron? This is Ezra, I think. I think that was Ezra. Oh, Ezra was yeah. trying to claim that you could no, you, you, could, yeah, you could trick yeah. you could trick a kid thinking a carrot was a reward, like an actual oh, thing you know that this you that was you. You wanted to this this something I would say. Thing. Well, yeah, this does sound like something I would say, but I, I think it makes sense. It's like. Uh, in cross country practices, sometimes they would have us like do push ups as a punishment for being late or whatever it was. Not me, obviously, but like the other kids, if they were ever late, you know, I fall <laughs> out of time. Um, but I don't like, I don't like uh, having a positive, like a, a positive activity counted as like a negative thing in your mind as far as like punishing someone to do push ups. And then they think push ups are a bad thing. So I think I'm guessing that's kind of the same thought I had when I said, you can no, reward you were, them with chaos. If you, you, if were, you make them think the chaos is a reward, <laughs> then they're going to like it. No, you were basically saying you're going to be able to brainwash your kids into thinking Everyone's that. Everyone's brainwashed, uh, Brody. To thinking that. Brody. At least I'm brainwashed into thinking that an Oreo is delicious, and it is. I'm it's not, so bad. It's still unhealthy, though. I'm not. That's health fine. Are you saying health isn't a reward, Brody? Health is a reward. That's fine. But okay. I'm just yeah, saying there's no shot you're ever going to get a kid to think like, oh, my God, it's a carrot. Because they're gonna go, they're gonna go to like. Feed the, them in broccoli. Maybe that was you. Maybe you were saying broccoli. Yeah, maybe. No, I'm just saying. But what if you only give them salad? Like, what if you only feed them salad and then like, hey, today we're gonna have a carrot. That'd be ecstatic. I'm not saying I'm gonna do that because that would be bad. No, but you, you would have to. Much. You would have to keep them in a bunker their whole life because well, if they tried anything outside, no. Aaron, do you, not. 
Do not take his side, Aaron. I'm going to come in with this one. If you raise the kid and you spent your whole time raising the kid, also being like, wow, this carrot's the best thing I've ever had in my life. Then the mm. kid will be like, oh, he loves carrots and he's my dad. Yeah. Then I could see it working a little better. If you, if you, if you made it like that I mean, one is thing. This, where the, is this kid never having a chocolate chip cookie though? Well, of course not. Are, the but then the, the kid would be like, <laughs> The kid would just, I think the it's that learned behavior too of that, like, hey, if the if the parent is like, this is something that really matters to that person, that this is what okay. they like, I'm also going to like it. I have so many yeah. ways of debunking this, but we're going to go. <laughs> okay, okay. We're going to, we're going to, well, we're going well, to we're gonna go soon enough. We're going to go to the, uh, we're going to get to the next topic here before we go down this rabbit hole. Um, well, just real quick too on this. Oh gosh, all right, all no, right. I have to, just give me <laughs> one a second. Taste buds are so, uh, you know, fluctuatable, if that's even a law, but taste buds yes. change a lot. So if, if, if the kids are only eating healthy food their entire life, they may not even like Oreos. Unlikely, but it's like, there's a chance they don't like the unhealthy food because they've never been exposed to it. And so it's going to be foreign. It would be. I'm it, not going to like, try to like be nefarious with my kids and like, you know, only feed them broccoli, but I don't no, know. but you know, you're, you're right. Because if you, if you're constantly in, in, um, if you're constantly eating sugar in, you okay. know, sodas and, uh, sweets and all that, and then you, yeah. you have a banana, the way that banana tastes to you is way different. If someone has completely cut sugar out of their diet, that banana is yeah. way sweeter. So yeah, no, I a hundred percent understand. Well, what you're and, and the piece of candy that you are eating when you're eating all the sugary foods is going to be disgusting because it's going to taste way too sugary. Way too sweet. As yeah. well. So it's yeah. like, yeah. 100%. Okay. Do you guys feel pressure from the tour to stay quiet about changes to the tour itself? If not, do you feel your voice is heard when you speak up about anything regarding tour changes? I thought this was a fascinating mm -hmm. question. Do you guys um, feel any think, pressure from I, the tour? Definitely. I, I, this is what I would say. I don't. I don't think I feel any pressure. Like I don't think I feel like they're specifically telling us not to, to say stuff. So I don't feel any pressure in that regard. I think there was probably a sense of respect for the tool that I have that I feel like probably just it's it's like an unwritten rule. We just probably don't say certain things. Um, as far as my voice being hard, I don't feel like I say a whole lot. You know, this is probably going on this podcast is probably about as much <laughs> as I talk about any of these issues ever. So I guess we'll see what the backlash is. Uh, but I don't, I don't feel any any pressure specifically from the pro tour. I would just say it's more of a respect thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't say it's it's from the pro tour, but I think that there is pressure on a lot of these topics, especially especially with the trans um, issues coming out. Of uh, just like right. I think the pressure is more of how the fans see you. So you don't want to come out and just fully support one side or fully support the other side because you don't want to lose people that are following you. So I think it's far less from the pro tour and more from that perspective on the things you don't want to like talk about. As far as the being heard, though, um, I felt like I've been uh, very well heard these last few years. I've been trying to be very vocal about my opinions, and I think a lot of people have a respect for my opinions. So um, it, it's gotten to this point where um, – when I have something to say, I know that people are actually listening to it and giving it some thought, which is nice. And then the other thing is I uh, finally was like, I just got to go ahead and do it. And I signed up for the um, the rules committee on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. So I think Ooh. that's another aspect that I can actually okay. make a difference and get my voice heard as well. So I've just been a little bit more proactive and trying to um, help out with the things I really care about. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I don't think I've ever felt from any tour employee or any, um, you know, executive on the tour, like pressure to not say anything. And I've, I probably say the most out of anyone on tour, but I, I agree. I think majority of pros feel that from the, that the pressures from the fans, right? The pressure is how do I word this in a way to where I don't lose fans? Or is there even a way of me even saying this without losing fans? And you're going to have some people with where the money is right now in disc golf. You're just going to have some people just not say anything. And that is, that is what it is. Um, and I think it'll be, it'll be a very interesting day. If the money in disc golf ever gets to the point to where players just like, don't really care what fans think of them. And then we can actually kind of see what people say. Cause there always will be those people that are like, I don't really want to stir up anything. I don't want it, but there will be people that are just like, I'm just going to let it fly. Cause I don't, I don't give a rip. And I want, I want to say what I want to say. And that's only going to ever happen when, you know, purses are 
the winner's taking home one hundred fifty thousand dollars and not fifteen thousand. Um, the paycheck doesn't rely on it. Yes. Right. Do you think that there were a lot of like uh uh do you think that there was a, like a majority of playoffs that are actively holding their tongue with issues because of that? Or do you think a lot of them are just kind of like honestly I don't really care enough to even voice my opinion even if I was getting paid? I think that's the majority. I think the majority of people do not care. Um, but I there there certainly are players for sure that uh give off a certain persona online that is not really equivalent to what they are in person. And, for sure, for sure, I, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that's the majority. No, I would disagree with you a little bit, and I'm, I'm not saying this from like an extreme point of view, but I think every single person on tour censors themselves to an extent, and um, I think it may be a good thing. But I think that every single person thinks to themselves, "Hey, this is what I think, and I can't say it in the way that I would like to say it because of this reason," and so it, I. I don't think it is a minority of players that are like that. I think that's almost everyone, but it's just the extent to which they're censoring themselves. Yeah. I, th- I think that's what, I mean, I think we all, right. I think any good human kind of censors themselves, right? Because right. depending on who you're around, you're probably not going to say certain things. So yeah, I, I agree with you there. I guess, yeah, I guess what we're saying more is like, um, there, there's a lot of people that just choose not to be present on social media or take a stance on anything. They're just right. like, hey, I'm just going to post me throwing Frisbees and post about how I do in tournaments, and that's it. And, uh, you know, you can't fault people for that because, again, at the end of the day, you know, you come out. And we saw a little bit with Austin Hannum, right? I don't know if you guys remember when he went on Twitter and he kind of yeah. just started letting it rip on Twitter. Uh, we kind of saw what could happen. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I can't fault anyone like that because I do it myself. I I am completely in that, that category of I would rather not stir the pot. I'd rather keep a clean slate and have people like me. And I'll share my opinions um, that try to, like, I don't know, in, in a sense that is very toned down from my personal beliefs. So I, I can't fault anyone for that. Uh, question on that. What what would you call the FPO players that didn't vote for Chris and Tatar player of the year? <laughs> so I, on the same issue, I, uh, <laughs> would you I call them a ahead. joke? Do you think they're a joke? <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I, I back you hundred percent, Brody. I'm, if I'm going to lose a few fans over that, it's okay. It's, 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 it's a, it's a crazy one. <laughs> this is the thing I'll say to you. Um, I voted for all stars and I did not vote for the people that I thought deserved all stars. What? Okay, you should vote. You should vote. I I voted for Ezra. You know what I mean? I voted for Ezra Ayer because he's on the cusp. Because I'd rather see Ezra in the All Stars versus I think Ezra Robinson deserves to be in the All Stars more. And I think that that's okay. a lot of the case that's going on. No, 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 no. The difference between Ezra Ezra Aderhold and Ezra Robinson for an All Star pick is very different from oh, it. Agreed, who should agreed. the player I'm, of the I'm, year should be. I'm just saying well, that well, on also, that same token, th- this yeah. is a, an experience that I've had myself. And I could see okay. someone being like, I'm not going to vote for Kristen because I would rather see so-and-so win it, even if they're not deserving of it. Okay, I, I, think, it's two, I think it's two completely different. I think you're wrong, Jan. I'm sorry. I think, I think, I think, I, I think Ezra well, is deserving for, well, for an all-star spot. But well, I, I wasn't. I wasn't top twelve, so I, I wasn't dissolving. But I don't think that's. I don't think that's the same thing. You could have got in with the you fan vote, play. though. Okay. Right. The, yeah, well, I'm gonna give you that. The player of the year is who do you think the best player was for that season? I don't think those. I don't think there should be any bias. Any. I want to see this person win the award because then people vote for themselves. I think it makes the whole system just flawed, and it's just not a good situation. The All Star thing, they literally put the fan vote in there for people to vote for the players they want to see in the actual All Star event. So I think you voting for me in that. Uh, situation instead of Ezra Robinson makes total sense if you'd rather see me play in that event. So I don't think that though, I don't think there's any conflict of interest though. Like if I, Jake, I if Jake there. Wolf was like a top 20 player, I could see like a Jake Wolf getting into the All Star because of just how interesting he is. Like there's a lot of for Jake Wolf for that. That makes total sense. Yeah. There's yeah. no, I think it's two, two totally, totally different things. I, I agree with you guys, and I think that it is kind of ridiculous that she wasn't voted for uh, by everyone. But I would say that I am in this category of someone who didn't vote for someone that I felt deserved the spot more for the All Star when I voted for someone else. You, you know what I mean? But, I, I did. No, actually, but you you, you actually have an argument. A little bit. 
You have an argument, though. Of course I have an argument. I'm just saying that I can see how someone does that for the other thing. But there's no argument the other way. I was able to convince myself in this way. No, but you could could literally pose an argument of why you think Ezra should be an all-star instead of – sorry. Why should this Ezra should be an all-star versus the other Ezra? You have no argument on why someone should be player of the year over Kristen. That's the problem is there is – you cannot pose an argument. So I you, guess this is this is my argument right here, is that I don't think Ezra deserved it, and I don't think I deserved it to be an all star. Period. Okay. So straight up, me doing this is lying. So to myself, even though there is an argument to be made for we we do deserve to be all stars, I shouldn't vote for myself because I think the top twelve players deserve it more than you know we did at like fourteen and fifteen. No, and you gotta have the you gotta have you gotta have the fan vote in mind, there. In my mind, that's lying, and so that's okay. why. And I still did it, and that's why I'm saying yeah. that I think I could see someone doing that for Kristen as well. But, is but they the all stars are lying. The all stars are not the anyway. top. The all stars are not the top twelve players. Agree. Agree. Well, I, I, yeah, I, dis- I disagree. I disagree. I don't I and I don't think that you I don't actually I think you think let's see. I think that you that you voted for the people that you think most deserve the spot. So I, th- I don't think the, the all-star event is supposed to be entertaining for the fans and for yourself. Mm-hmm. You're going to be watching. So I think you voted for me over Ezra Robinson because you thought that I would be, maybe be able to provide a better show where you wanted to see your friend, you know, compete in things. So I think you actually did vote for the people you thought deserved it. Also, I feel like if both both the other Ezra and myself could have been in it and maybe battled and had like little nemesis <laughs> Ezra off, that would be awesome. <laughs> Why don't people vote for both of us? Oh, I your guys is tr- Your guys' oh. trash talk would have been incredible. I bet. I I would have loved to see that press. Yeah, conference. we hate each other. It'd be it'd be crazy. Oh man. I did challenge Nicholas to paddle when we uh, when we get to Europe. Oh. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to see uh, what what all the hype is about. Well, pretty soon Dude, the whole tour need- is gonna be in Europe. So uh, paddle <laughs> paddle sweet. We need to have we need to have a doubles match too as well. It's you and me versus Ezra and Nicholas. I think. Ooh, there we go. There that we go. Be, the full nemesis fun. match. And we'll be like, you guys yeah. have to be partners. <laughs> we don't care if you like, like right. no, we don't, we don't, we don't, don't play this game. Game. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even play this game. Doesn't matter. So um, what are the chances that it was all accidental that, that the people that act, you know, misvoted for, uh, you know, against Kristen, like wait, accidental. Is I'm that just, what people are just claiming? Like, no, 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 no. But um, how, it was what, like six, six votes didn't vote for Kristen. It's like four, four to five Human people. Error, four or five people. I mean, I don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I don't want to. I Wait, want to what think are that, you, like, you saying? They, mis- they misclicked? Is that what you're claiming? It could, it could, be, a could be an error in the system is what he's saying. Probably possible it was a misclick. Pro- probably yeah. not that likely though, is my Unlikely, guess. yeah. I think, I think it was, yeah. I think, I'm just, listen, I'm just putting it out though. I'm just saying. I like, could see. Mis- I could see. Mis- you know, click normal box. You were scrolling, and you just, you know, you tap, and you got, you know, a little. Your fingers may be a little bit slick with some <laughs> baking grease or whatever it is. You click the wrong <laughs> one. I don't know. You only vote for one person, and I could see that someone just being best friends with that person and being like, "I'll, I'll vote for you yeah, instead of." They don't get to vote next year, Aaron. <laughs> I, I see what you're saying. They, they, that they literally said that in the in the in the fine print of the voting. Oh really? Yes. You Maybe lose your. Be you, out and saying this. <laughs> you, no, but you're, say, you're saying <laughs> no, it in a different no, way. Well, Mine's for all star, so I'm in the clear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they literally said like, if we see that you're voting, you know, if there's like a, if there's anything that you're doing that isn't like, in my opinion, I, anyone, I anyone that didn't vote for Kristen, you have no argument, so you should lose right. your vote. Like you okay. should lose your vote next year because well, yeah, we, you're not capable of making you, a good decision. You don't want this to be a popularity contest. You don't want someone to say, Hey, right. we're going to, we're yeah. going to give you guys free pizza every Friday. Vote for me for class president. Like, no, it, it goes to, it goes to the best player of the year. So um, is this right. a different, just first of all, is this a different player of the year thing? than another, is there, are there two different player of the year awards? PDGA has a player of the year and that's strictly a, like alg- algorithm thing. Yeah. yeah okay. Where it just I plugs gotcha. it in. Cool. Yeah. This, this is literally vote. So this is voted by your peers that are on tour with you. And by voted by, I, I went through the list. There's like 30 media people and they all got votes and all, okay. all the media yep. people voted for Kristen Tatar. So it was right. just a handful of FPO players that uh, will ever be jokes in my head from now on. Um, all right. Last qu- uh, two questions here, two questions, and then we'll wrap it up boys. Uh, 
the new disc Kratos from Discraft. Did you guys? Dude, this is crazy to me that the people in the comments know more about. <laughs> I've never heard of this. I've never heard of this. I, I, it was. It, I've never I, heard of it. Never heard of it. I don't know. This was the first thing that Sounds I heard. Like I, I heard of it the first today as well. Someone sent huh. me a photo of it. It looks like it's supposed to be. Uh, people are speculating it's going to be a more overstable Luna. Is the speculation? Oh, okay. I I uh, will withhold any information that I have. Oh, okay. Okay, okay right. hear me out though. As right. Oh, oh, we got oh. a photo of it. There it is. <laughs> wow. Hey, yep. Isaac Robinson, play off the year. Okay, <laughs> but Paul Macbeth has all the Greek gods, you know, going. Or no, they're not all gods, but a lot of Greek gods, right? So Kratos is the god of war and goes through and kills all the gods in the video games. All right. So maybe Whoa. this is like the this is like the epitome. This is like the what takes down the beast. Wow. I don't know. I don't know. It's a stretch. Maybe, maybe this, is, this is this is full circle to what we were talking about with MVP. Maybe it's going to be like a break off, and it's going to be its own. It's going to be yeah. quick. It's going to kill all of them off, and then they have to start their own little like mini company thing. Who knows? I can't believe Didn't there's a disc out. that we don't know about that <laughs> just came out on Discraft. <laughs> well, I don't. I, well, I don't think it's out yet. I think I think you have guys that like scour the PDGA thing yeah. of when discs get like approved oh, and whatnot. And so you can see sometimes discs are on there before anyone's even talking about them. I don't know if okay. that even should. Be, I don't know if that should be public information. Right. Is it kind what of? Yeah, I wonder why it is. What about the groove top? When's that one getting approved? It just got wow. approved yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it did. Is Don GT dead? No, oh, well, no, it's the bank. No, the, yeah. no, the, one, no, right? the Kratos. The Kratos, the, Kratos the, the Kratos did. Oh, the Kratos got approved. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the that, GT oh, still hasn't. As far yeah. as I'm aware. If anybody voted for the bank top, they also shouldn't be able to vote next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it's probably mostly our fault. Like foundation's been pushing that so hard. I like no, the ring. That's I, a fun I, stuff, though. I can't I, I can't fault them. I like the ringer a lot more, but it is mine. All right, last question, boys, and then we'll get you out of here because I don't want to take too much of your time. What is the best ice cream flavor? Oh, jeez. This is something that all three of us hold near and dear to our hearts. We, uh, this might be, this might be our number one thing that um, this and maybe Mexican food are the two. Like we probably had the most meals with either ice cream or Mexican food, right? Like with a specific type of thing. We had more Mexican food, but we had a lot of ice cream. Okay. Well, I'm okay. I'm healthy. I'm vegan. I'm healthy, so I don't I don't have to eat ice cream, obviously. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna have to ice stuff juice. Ice, ice juice. juice, yeah. Now it's vegan. We'll say I always eat vegan ice cream only. Only Never vegan ice diets. cream. So I would go um, out and say anytime we go out to one of these places, I like to pick some kind of crazy like flavor. I think that's kind of what I go to is like something new and you know out there. But um, as far as like yeah, classic like favorite, I gotta go cookie dough. But that's pretty basic. A good one. That's good. I I don't really know. I'm, I'm gonna say do a steel chai. I like caramel. Ooh. So I think that's that's gonna be my pick. Mine is yeah. the uh, mint chocolate chip. Absolutely love that. Good. Uh, let's go back to Ezra's real quick. It's okay. Dolce de leche, except it's just listen. it's just no. it's just Dolce because there's no okay. leche. Hey, there's no leche hey, in on. it. Hey, on. I live in America. All right, it's I can I'm free to say whatever I want to say. Okay, if I want to pronounce it like that, I can pronounce it like that. I knew I was gonna get it wrong if even if I pronounced it correctly. So I just you know I'm not French or whatever like, where it comes from. Oh, yeah, yeah, close. He's not close. he's not on the podcast tonight to defend himself, but let's just talk about how weird Jeeves is that he goes to ice cream places and get milkshakes. That mm. that is an automatic weirdo if you do that. I'm I, sorry. Yeah. I've said it to his face. It, it's a cardio it, thing, I think. It's a cardio. He's trying to keep his cardio low, right? Licking the ice cream takes too much. Just sucking it through the straw. It's an efficiency thing. He's he's thinking takes, close up to that. It takes it's 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 a it's a it's a I mean you're taking someone away. They're having now to like make your milkshake. They can't scoop ice cream for everyone else. It's a completely just a selfish maneuver by anyone, and it's also just an absolute wild move. To go to an ice cream shop and ask for a milkshake. Wild. 
The, the one thing I'll say is if you go to a soft serve ice cream place, milkshake's perfectly reasonable. But if if they've got like the buckets there with the ice cream scoop yeah. and you don't get a scoop, you're you're doing something wrong with your you life. You got all the sure. toppings to, yeah. to put onto it. Yeah. It's it's uh it's, it's a weird one. Um all right, boys. Well, that's gonna end it. Uh I'll 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 wrap up the show. We got a few like housekeeping things, but I'm not gonna keep you guys for that. Um anything to say to the people listening? We got a couple hundred people in here listening right now. Anything to say to the people excited? Check you guys out on YouTube, Instagram, anything like that. Shout out. Buy your um, signature series this. <laughs> what's your what, what signature series did you guys get? I got the Nuke OS, which I was super happy with. It's uh, one of the the best flying uh, discs they've done for me this year. So big fan of that. Um, thank you for having me on here. I always love coming on podcasts, sharing my opinions. And then if you guys stay posted, I'll be down in Arizona pretty soon and hopefully do some videos with Ezra and AB um, while we're all hanging out down in Zona. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. We really appreciate it. Looking forward to the next season. Get the band back together. But yeah, like Alan said, if you guys want to follow, I guess my YouTube channel is going to be the best place. We've got some, I've been putting some money into some sets for some uh, more, a little little bit higher production type YouTube videos that I'm excited for. No, I don't want to spoil too much, but yeah, Ooh. they should be fun. We've got two <laughs> two films and then the editing process is kind of in the, in the, in the works. So then we've got maybe four or five more we want to make in the next couple of weeks. So January and February should be, should be fun, uh, fun YouTube content. So stay tuned for that. Very and, nice. Uh, yeah, Very nice. Well, yeah, always, always a plus getting back, getting you guys back on the podcast. I guess we're going to have to try to not get in those sticky situations where we like are basically getting Airbnbs from like drug dealers and stuff. So <laughs> we might want to, we might want to start looking into booking some of those That's in cool. the next, the next few weeks. I think, yeah, I think we need to book way like well in advance. Obviously, that was a bit of an issue last season. <laughs> just because yes. it's like, what, you don't want to do it. But I think even more so this year, because we go to some we go to some locations where there's not a whole lot of population, so not a lot of Airbnb offerings. And I think there's going to be some more people on tour doing the Airbnb route. So I think there's going to be some more competition to see who can get the best the best house. So I think we got to jump on it before, you know, the whole Gannon Bar, uh, uh, Golden Harris clan. Oh, they're the doing house. it? Just, oh, we can't let them. So. We can't let them take, yeah. We got to get the good house before they do. We can't let them do it. The McDonald's house is what we call that no one. No way. Um, <laughs> all right, no boys. That's what we need to get beat out by? <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Appreciate you, boys. Uh, take it easy. Uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, sir. Take care. All right, deuces. Bye. All right, Silas, me and you, let's end the show. A uh, couple housekeeping things to talk about. We've got mon monthly subscription boxes. You have a few more days left. I think we're less than, I don't know, we got like 25 or so of those bad boys left. So go over to foundationdisc.com for all your disc golf needs, but also check out the monthly subscription box. I've been talking about it all month. We've got some really cool special edition Discraft disc, which Silas, give me a second real quick. Hold on. For our listeners, uh, this will not be too interesting, but for our viewers, uh, let me show you some of the discs because I actually got one. So this is what it comes in. It comes in this sweet new foundation disc golf box. Very nice. Uh, when you open it up too, it says on the front, your day just got better. So a very nice branded foundation disc golf box. And these are the, some of the, again, it's a kind of a mystery of what disc you're actually going to get, but these are some of the discs I got. This is a cool rip it looking disc. Um, I already forgot kind of what these were. This is an F7. So very cool rip it looking disc, the cool design. And then we have a halo leopard three with a Christmas foundation kind of design on it. Very nice, very nice. And then we have a Zona West that's in like a really cool kind of waxy. Um, I almost want to say it's like a jawbreaker swirl or ESP soft zone. I, I don't know exactly what plastic it is, but it feels incredible. So that was my subscription box. So if that is in, in, of interest to you, foundationdisc.com, check it out. Shouts to all of our new Tour Life crew members tonight. Remember, if you're joining us live here on the YouTube, 
uh, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. It's only $199. That gives you access to live chat. That gives you access to have a badge next to your name. So in the comments, you kind of stick out. It also helps support the show, which we really appreciate. Um, also, we just did a Q&A for this month last week. So if you missed that, go check it out. That's another perk of being a part of the Tour Life crew. And we appreciate you guys so, so much. Um, all right. Update. Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Spotify, we are closing in on 1,000 reviews on Spotify. So if you're listening to us right now on Spotify, drop us a review. We're at 834. Apple, pulling up the rear. We already know what it is. 214 for Apple. Instagram giveaway, 4,640 followers on Instagram. Once we hit 5,000, we're doing this two-disc giveaway. So go follow us over on Instagram, Tour Life underscore podcast to get all your clips. And also you get to see kind of what guests are coming on. We post some other stuff on there as well. So go check that out. Stylus, am I missing anything, brother? Did we get it all done? I think we got it all. We got it all done. Fantastic. Hopefully you guys all had a wonderful Christmas. Hopefully Santa gave you all the gifts you wanted. And uh, you know what? This is the last podcast of the year. So um, we'll leave it at that. And I'll see you guys next year.